Right, my mobile phone says it's 10 o'clock, which means that uh, we start this dissertation where Rona, uh, <laughs> Thomas, <laughs> Thomas, Thomas, Thomas is going to defend his thesis. Fish lens is anatomy and optics. That's a really nice short title that I can even remember. So, welcome everyone to this dissertation. We also would to like to especially welcome our opponent, our faculty opponent. Is Linda Lundström over there. She's from the Royal in uh, Institute of Technology in Stockholm and uh, she's a physicist working on uh, visual optics in not in fish but in humans. But then again, we used to be fish of some sort. Not <laughs> um, we also have an examination committee consisting of Professor Krista Brönmark from our own department here. Uh, Krista is a uh, Aquatic ecologist, so certainly knows about fish and what they need to see. Uh, <laughs> we have Ron Douglas from uh, City University of London, uh, who's an expert on uh, fish eyes and fish vision. You've done lots of really wonderful papers on deep sea fish, which I really admire. So it's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, we have Anna Stadner from. Uh, also from Lund University, but from another department, from the Department of Chemistry. I know you've dealt with all sorts of things with proteins, how, how they pack and how they move and things like that. And also I've been working on uh, transparency in, in, in lenses, human lenses, I guess, or no? Calf lenses. Calf lenses, right, yeah. So we've got a very competent uh, examination committee, knows everything that you would like to know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the procedure today is such that uh, we'll start with Linda, who will give uh, a general overview of the field, after which Thomas will <clears throat> present his thesis. And after that, the actual dissertation or opposition starts, where Linda will uh, ask lots of nasty questions to Thomas until he's completely exhausted. And when he's completely exhausted, then we'll... Uh, give the examination committee uh, opportunities to make him even more exhausted. <laughs> uh, after which uh, the thesis is, or is open for uh, questions from the audience, and that's about what we're going to do. Do you feel ready, Linda? Okay. <clears throat> yeah, first of all, thank you for, for inviting me. It's an honor to discuss with everyone. Uh, but before we go into detail, uh, I will start with an overview uh, of today's topic. So, the optics of the eye, uh, and I will talk about the eye that we are all familiar with. So, I will start with talking about the human eye, and then I let Thomas eye go into the eye of the fish. Um, this is a, a very multi subject, uh, and I have approached it from the side of the physics point of view. So that's the perspective that we're going to get this presentation in now today. Uh, and I will tell you a little bit about the optics and how, how fine-tuned the optics of the human eye is, and especially about the characteristics of the physical lens. But starting with an overview, uh, that the human eye is a complex organ that can detect information about an object at a distance by analyzing the reflected light. And so it's a kind of like the uh, eye. That means it has two main components. It has an object, an optics component that corresponds to the objective of the camera. And then it has a sensory component that corresponds to the, the sensor of the camera. So that's the retina. Uh, the optics component, uh, usually, since the skeleton consists of two components. We have the first surface here, that's the cornea. Uh, this is the surface between air and uh, the water like substance that we have inside of the eye. And when lights are when the light is reflected by the cornea, the, the, the cornea is the main component in this reflectance, in, in this refraction uh, of light. The second component is the crystalline lens, which we will talk a lot about today. So the crystal lens and cornea together refract the light into the image uh, at the back of the eye. And apart from the crystal lens and the cornea,
California, the human eye also has an iris that has plays a role in in how the the quality of the image on the retina would look, and that's the iris. Uh, the iris is limiting the pupil, so this is the aperture stop of our eye, and that will also have influence on the image quality. So when the light has been refracted by the cornea and the crystalline lens, it will pass through the water-like media, the vitreous body, that doesn't have any optical role except for that it should be transparent and emit light passing through it. So there, there are no there are no blood vessels as such in the vitreous body. The blood vessels is that you see a draw being drawn here on the art, on the retina of the eyes. So hopefully the light ends up successfully at the retina. And here at retina we have two uh, areas that are of special interest for the human eye. Uh, one is the fovea or the macula. Uh, this is where we have our densest packing of photoreceptors. So this is where the cones are very densely packed to give us a high spatial resolution. And that also means we see this in small fit here. That means that it's also, yeah, here we don't have any blood vessels in front of the photoreceptor to give us accurate vision and top look. So the photoreceptors are converting the information in the light into, into electrical signals. Uh, the first image processing is done already in, at the level of the retina. So the, the information from the photoreceptors are transferred via different neurons, by polar cells, and, and eventually ganglion cells to send the information to the brain. And this information is sent via the optic nerve that leaves the eye yeah, here in the optic disc. So here we don't, that's our blind spot. So here we don't have any vision because here we have the nerve ends for the actions uh, of the ganglion cells leaving the eye. So to have as good accurate vision as possible, or as, at least as high spatial resolution as possible, we need to get a, a sharp, nice image on the retina. And that means that we have very high demands on the optical components, because they need to deliver this sharp, nice image. So I tried to make a list of what demands we have on our optical components, on the cornea and the crystalline lens. So they need to provide the correct optical power so that we get the image to actually end up at the plane of the photoreceptors. But we have so that we don't have any focus in the image. And we need to have a very high transparency. Otherwise, the light will be scattered and we get a lower contrast image. We also need to have it sharply focused. So we want all the rays to merge into all rays from one point and we want it to merge into one point in the image as well. And last but not least, we want to have a variable optical power because we want to be able to see at different distances. And I will go into these four uh, points in more detail. Um, just first saying that when it comes to the optical components of the eye, it is the, for, the cornea is mainly contributing to giving us the correct optical power and also it's providing high transparency. But it's not tuned give sharply focused images for variable optical power. Because that, for that, we need the crystal lens. So the crystal lens is the one that features all of these four components, whereas the cornea is mainly providing optical power and access transparency. <clears throat> so let's look at the first point here, about <coughs> the correct optical power. So the correct optical power that is defined as the eye should be able to see sharply at the distance. So that is what you see the upper, in the upper eye here. This is an amotropic eye. That means that the optical power of the cornea together with the lens is <coughs> so that the image ends up on the retina. <coughs> and we have the common refractive errors, but this is not the case. Uh, the first one is that you can be myopic. That means that the refractive power of the cornea and the lens are too high for in comparison to the length of the eye. And thereby the best image will end up in front of it. And you would actually have it if you use the focus image on the retina when you look at the distal part. 
and you only see shark when you move the if you move the object closer to it. And the opposite case is when you are hygrophic instead or hypermetropic. And that means that the power on the corner in the lens is too weak, and thereby the the best image will end up behind the retina. And this means that you don't see well at a distance and you don't see well at up close either. And for a young hyperopic eye can accommodate to to compensate for the hypermetropia. But usually this means that you are in need of positive spectral glasses, whereas for the myopic eye is in need of negative spectral. So the cornea and the crystal lens are both contributing to the optical power of the eye. And the cornea is a, it's a surface I was almost saying spherical circles, but it's not. It's actually a spheric in shape. Uh, it has it has about eight millimeter of, of radius of curvature, uh, and since it's a surface in between air and the water-like substance, uh, it will it will contribute to about forty dioptics. So the corner contributes to the majority of your effective power of that, uh, whereas the crystal lens gives rise to about 20 dioptics. Actually, the crystal, this power of crystalline crystal lens is higher than what would be expected when you first look at its shape. Because <coughs> uh, the crystal lens is immersed in a, in a water-like medium here that is very light, that has a very refractive index that is very similar to its own refractive index. So in spite of the surfaces being curved, will not it that have been predicted not to have such a high power. However, uh, the refractive index within the crystal lens, here you see a cross section uh, of the crystal lens, the refractive power within the crystal lens is not uniform. Uh, we have a lower refractive power refractive index in the, the periphery of the lens or the outer edges of the lens. Uh, and then as we move through the cortex and into the nucleus, the Refractive index increases. And this is called the gradient index. So one often refers to this type uh, of structures as green lenses, green profiles. <coughs> and the nice thing in using a green profile is that you can get higher powers, refractive powers out of it than you would have if you would just have a uniform shape. So if we would have been, if we would replace the crystal lens. Uh, with a lens of the same shape but with uniform material inside, we would have need to have much higher refractive index of that lens than what the eye is actually having. So it's a very, it's a very nice, very nice uh, uh, feature of of, na of nature to have made this gradient index. And gradient index lenses are also manufactured nowadays for other purposes, just because it can provide this this refractive power independent of how you curve your surface. You can actually make a flat surface with lens that has the power because you just because how you design your, your refractive index profile. So moving on to the next point of, uh, regarding the high transparency of the optics. Um, I'm here only looking at the transparency of the cornea and the crystal lens. Of course, we have the aqueous humor in the, in the imperial chamber and also the vitreous body, but they are more water-like structures. They are more transparent by, by nature. However, it is quite astonishing that nature has been able to make the cornea and the lens as transparent as they are. Because the cornea, both of them are uh, quite rigid. Now, the cornea in the human eye, the cornea is more rigid than the motor lenses. So, the cornea consists of collagen fibers that are oriented very, in very regular patterns. Uh, and that it's the regularity of these patterns that makes it so transparent to light. Uh, the same goes for the, for the lens. We will, I think that we will hear Thomas talk more about the transparency later on. But the lens is also <coughs> has also specialized on how to make the cells within the lens, the fiber cells in the lens, as transparent as possible. 
and one of the key factors here is that this again that the fiber the fiber cells are all, are all in these regular patterns, these shells that are very regular. And that means that they don't scatter light as much. If you would have irregularities, or if you would get irregularities either in the cornea, that's that can happen if you get a scar, for example, in the cornea, or if you get irregularities within the lens, as happens in cataract, uh, then the light that that hits those irregularities would be diffused here, is reflected all over. And the main problem with this is that the scattered light that ends up on the on the retinal plane here lower the compass in the A section, thereby making it harder for us to see. <clears throat> and on the third point uh, that I wanted to look at uh, was this with actually having a sharp refocused image. So going from, I said that the scattered light is giving us, is causing like a diffuse, a diffuse wave of light over, over the retina. So can happen also if you don't have any regularity in your, in your media, but because of the irregularities in how the light is reflect, reflected to the light. So one of those <coughs> things are, is called spherical aberration. And this occurs when, when we compare the rays that are entering through the center of the pupil, or through the center of the aperture stuff, so the sheet frame here. Uh, they are refracted in a different way due to the loss of our physics. They are refracted differently compared to the rays that are entering through a more peripheral location in the pupil. You can see this is the most common type of spherical vibration that you and I has. And it consists of that we have rays, the rays that enter through the center of the pupil, they will end up on the retina, so amyotropic eye because it's been well at the distance. Uh, whereas the rays that are entering through the edges of the pupil are refracted more. So they actually experience a higher refractive power and will end up slightly myopic. So they are focused in front of the retina. And that means that we have a slightly blurred image on the retina. So this is referred to as positive spherical aberration, and it's the main aberration that the cornea gives us. So the positive spherical aberration uh, is said to be, has been measured to be around 0.3 micrometers per six millimeter pupil. And this will, of course, affect our vision. It's highly dependent on the pupil size, though. So if we have a small, you see, if we would have a small pupil size here, so we would have only left the centermost rays the light, then it will not cause that large blur in the retina. However, if you open up the pupil, then we also get this modular rays entering that, then we'll get a larger blur in the retina. I have a small I mean, a more simulation of that. This is showing this is showing a night driving situation. Uh, and as this is now just a photo of the night driving situation and as if we then put the spherical aberration on top of this, we can start with simulating what the retina, what, it, what the image quality of the retina would look like if you have a two millimeter pupil. So this is a very small pupil, and not a natural pupil during dark condition. But you can see that the, we still have quite nicely point sources here from, or point light images from the lens. However, if we start increasing, the size of the pupil, you can see how these halo-like structures come in here. So we get halos around around the, the lamps or the point sources when, because of spherical aberration. It's not only spherical aberration that does this. It has, the eye has a lot of irregular you know, aberrations that can give different shapes of these halos. The spherical aberration is the main one. Uh, and I just told you that the cornea has very much a positive spherical aberration. Um, but actually, if you measure the eye as a whole, it doesn't, it has less spherical aberration. So we can see that we are more than, taking away more than 50%. Uh, and this is thanks to the testinal lens. So in spite of the fact that the cornea is causing a lot of aberrations, the crystalline lens is actually having an active process 
when stroll is actually active, actively compensating for the abrasions that are caused by the cornea. So in this case, it's the green, the graded index profile of the crystal lens that is cost, that is actually giving us a negative stereo abrasion that to compensate for the positive one uh, of the cornea. And it's also, it's not only the graded index distribution, it's also the fact that the, the, cornea, the spherical, these surfaces are not spherical, they are aspherical. That also helps giving the crystal lens to give rise to this negative stereo so there's an active process optimizing image quality uh, when the crystal lens is stable. So moving on to the last uh, feature of our optics, and that is the fact that we have a very low, very low optical power at least as young. Uh, so that means that even though the eye is anatomic at distance, we get a sharp image from the retina when you move distant objects. Uh, when you start looking up close, so you start having your object closer to you, uh, you still want to have the image on the retina. Uh, and that means that we need to increase the refractive power of the optics. And this is a process called accommodation, and it is made by the lens, uh, or maybe more accurately by the muscles, the ciliary muscles around the lens. So what you're seeing here is a drawing uh, of the eye, so on this side, we have the relaxed eye, that is when you look at distance. And on this side, we have the accommodating eye when you look up close. And what you can see is happening is that the lens is actually, is actually hanging with an eye on in, in, in this zone of fibers here. So this is ciliary muscle so that's attached to the, the, the sphere of the, of the eye. And when we are in our relaxed accommodatory state, the ciliary muscles are relaxed. So it means that they go, they move back towards the sphere and they stretch the sonal fiber. Uh, whereas when we accommodate and look up close, the ciliary muscle will contract. That means that we move closer to the lens, relaxing the fibers. So thereby the lens is not stretched anymore, but it can go back to its more curved shape. We can see that when the eye is accommodating, the lens will get thicker in diameter, and it will thereby get steeper also, so we have a larger curvature of the surfaces, and also it moves a bit forward. And this, all of these three components makes the refractive power of the eye larger, and thereby we can see up well up close. Uh, I also have some OCT images from uh, from the handbook of visual optics uh, that shows this in in the alive human eye. That here we have the relaxed state. So here you can see this is the cornea. Here you see the iris, and here is part of the lens. So the inferior surface, the inferior pole, and the superior pole of the lens. And you can see that when the eye is accommodating, the inferior pole moves further closer to the cornea and also getting more. So we have seen that the crystalline lens is a very complex optical structure. It has spherical surfaces and a graded index refractive uh, profile. Uh, that means that it's very difficult to model. There is a lot of ongoing research regarding creating a, an anatomically correct uh, optical model of the human eye uh, that actually can show all the features and all the and all the aspects of the, in the optical image quality of the human eye. And that is extremely challenging to do. Uh, furthermore, it's, it's transparent and it's also flexible for accommodation, so it shifts. It's, it's not the, the solid, it's, it doesn't stay the same, it, it's changing all the time. Uh, on top of that, we know that the lens grows throughout life. And this, I guess, Thomas wants to tell us more about. So we have this shell-like structure with the oldest cells in the nucleus of the, of, the, of, the, of the lens, and then newer, younger shells are added on top of them as the eye grows. And this growth is not only for the positive, at least not for, for the human eye. Uh, so we have <coughs> get age-related changes 
And the main ones are the fact that the growth will, as we age, will make the lens less transparent, and it also will make it less flexible. Less flexible. Uh, the transparency uh, changes uh, is called cataract. So, and that means that the scattering increases with age. Uh, so, here's all, again a cross section uh, of the eye. You can see the cornea here, and you can see the crystalline lens. You can barely see the crystalline lens here, it's the first surface. And whereas in the older eye, cataract has started developing, which means that the, the lens gets more <coughs> opaque and also more yellowish with age. Furthermore, uh, we have the flexibility changes. So as the eye gets less flexible, or the lens gets less, less flexible, it means that it will not increase its refractive power as much when you accommodate it more. And eventually it will stop increasing at all. And that will lead to presbyopia. And means that you are, even though you see well at distance, you will have trouble seeing sharply at near. And so you will have blurred vision for nearby objects, and you would need these reading glasses to see positive lenses to see objects up close. So these two uh, conditions, the cataract uh, and the presbyopia, uh, is causing uh, research as well as industry to look very much into how the lens is developing and why, how can we mimic the development of lens uh, and how can we maintain the flexibility and prosperity of the crystalline lens throughout our life. Uh, so, at the moment, it's the transparency. Transparency is usually taken care of by cataract sur surgery, meaning that you remove the the old opaque lens and you put in an artificial lens, intraocular lens instead. Uh, however, the flexibility of accommodation has been possible to limit. There is a lot of ongoing research about that. They have been trying to put in intraocular lens that should move when the ciliary muscle is moving. They have been trying to put in new or they're looking at possibilities to put in new materials that will mimic the gradient in its profile of the lens better. But so far, there is nothing that has been implemented. So, to be able to actually get to this goal of having keeping the transparency of the lens and keeping the flexibility of the lens, we need to understand better how the lens is working. Uh, so I would like to end by uh, reading out uh, the conclusions by Robert Augustin uh, in his review on the growth and internal structure uh, of the human lens. And in here he says, uh, in order to understand the mechanism underlying the development of presbyopia and cataracts, and to develop, develop possible treatments a thorough understanding of the growth of the lens would be of enormous value. At best, our knowledge is fragmentary, and concepts long considered to be set in concrete were actually built on very shaky foundations. So what he's saying is that we are still not fully understanding how the anatomy and the physiology of the lens works, and how it can create the optical conditions that it's creating. And actually, he's even saying that what we believe now to be true might actually not be true. So there's a lot of need for fundamental research on how the, the crystal lens is actually working. And that's when the animal models comes into, into play here. But we need to understand what's happening. And the best way to start looking is to start seeing what happens in the human in animal models, where you can look at different ages, you can look, look at what happens when we change different conditions, you have much, so much more freedom in, in investigating what is comparing. So that's where I thought Thomas will take over and tell us about one of the animal models. Thank you. Thank you very much, Linda, for this wonderful presentation. Um, Thomas, do you feel ready to present yes, your thesis? Right. That was a great, great introduction. And I think this, 
<clears throat> so, uh, imagine your plane crash, you landed on a tropical island. You need to survive, you need to probably start fire. Uh, you, if you travel with a magnifying glass, you probably can collect enough light to start uh, to, in one point to actually uh, heat up a grass or a little bit of wood and, and start a fire. Assuming you're not traveling with magnifying glass, you can solve this problem by making your own lens. Uh, because we are a terrible species, even though there's no humans on the island, there's probably garbage there. So you can pick up a plastic bag, fill it with water, and if you will make it into a sphere, it's good enough to actually collect light to concentrate it on the ground and start a fire. You don't have to believe me, there's plenty of YouTube videos showing just that. So it is possible. So if it's so easy to make a lens, then how come when you want to buy an objective camera, it's, uh, it's so expensive? It's because the lenses are not only to collect light, enough of light to do something, but it's also about creating sharp images. And that's um, what's important. Nature somehow figured it out, and uh, they made a, a, a various of, of uh, amazing lenses. And uh, I'll be talking today about uh, one of the type of the lenses, which is the, the fish lenses. Uh, I'll concentrate on three uh, projects that I was involved in, uh, where we used three different aspects of, uh, of fish lenses and, uh, and uh, uh, how we use them in the project. So first I will start by talking about specific um, uh, feature of lenses, uh, which is uh, how they concentrate light and at what distances, distances and so on. Uh, <coughs> to investigate how fishes uh, adapt to different lighting conditions. Uh, then I'm going to talk how we use general uh, image quality made by a fish lens uh, and, and how we learn something new about fish larvae. And then I will talk about actual uh, fish lens structure that we uh, investigated and uh, what are the consequences of, of that investigation. So starting, starting with project one, uh, we, just, uh, we, we were investigating plasticity, so ability of lens to, to adapt to different conditions. Uh, the story starts with uh, global warming. As I said, we are a terrible species. Uh, and because of the uh, raising temperature, the southern species of Atlantic cod invades the territory of more northern species of uh, polar cod. Uh, and for visual researchers, it, uh, it is interesting because that region is actually affected by uh, or experiences polar days and polar nights. So the uh, lighting conditions are, are a little bit unusual for us living down south. Uh, it is known that fish can adapt their lenses between day and night cycles. Uh, so it was interesting to see what happens up north where the, the light changes are uh, a little bit longer than, uh, than 24 hours. So uh, we investigated fish lenses and uh, I will just briefly guide you through uh, what I will show you because the graphs are really uh, sometimes difficult. Get. Uh, so we are interested in uh, how different parts of the lens, so this is what you see here, uh, how different regions, we start at the center, so that's the zero radius and that's the surface of the lens. Uh, we always express everything in, um, uh, in normalized to the lens radius because different lenses uh, should work, different size lenses should work in the same way, and uh, that's why we always try to normalize them. And the same goes for the distance, uh, so the distance at which the light will be focused uh, away from the lens is also expressed in the lens radius. So again, we are looking at the different positions of the lens, and if light hits them, uh, it's going to be deflected, and wherever it crosses the optical axis, the distance at, at which it crosses is uh, marked here. So we first started by, we went there to uh, during polar night. We caught plenty of fish. We started with uh, Atlantic cod. Uh, so some of the fish we kept in the dark as their natural, let's say, environment at that time, and some of the, the fish we exposed to light conditions for several hours so they will uh, have time to accommodate. Uh, and this is the result of our study. Uh, so the dark uh, dark points are representing the fish that was uh, not adapted, the, the, the natural conditions, how they were caught, and the white dots represent the uh, uh, fish uh, after the light treatment of several hours. So you can see that clearly something changed, that the fish changed their vision uh, after just a few hours of exposure to light. Uh, <coughs> when we try the same with, uh, with polar cod, which is native to the regions, we didn't saw any difference. They, they didn't seem to respond at all to, to several hours of uh, light. So it's kind of uh, it's kind of what, what we would expect because the changes are longer, so maybe they they simply don't care for changes that happen over several hours. So we decided to uh, keep up on this, and we uh, we tried again polar cod, and we measured them during polar 
our data to see if there's any difference between those lenses. And yes, there is a difference. They change their optics, maybe not uh, in the same way as the uh, Atlantic cod, but you see that uh, the polar day, which is uh, marked in white, is uh, very different than the uh, polar night lenses, which means that uh, polar cod change their lenses, but the changes that are, are more longer term. So that basically, to conclude this project, it seems that the fish that is south, it's kind of uh, intuitive that the fish that experiences naturally uh, circadian changes of uh, uh, light conditions, they have faster adaptation, a short term adaptation, whereas the species from um, that experience longer changes of, uh, of light, they have more longer plasticity or, or longer time for adaptation. Uh, <clears throat> switching to project two, uh, where we investigated the, uh, the, the fish larvae by using uh, image quality made by their, uh, by their lens. We tried to investigate their optics a little bit and we noticed that their lenses, when we put them in the conversion medium, they were basically uh, getting damaged or they were sometimes even uh, exploding. Uh, so we, we decided, we, we figured out that it's probably a small algae that is causing the problem, so we decided to test it. We build a setup, uh, this is not in scale, so we put a tiny little lens on top of a glass slide uh, that was placed on top of a, a, a tube with water and uh, at the bottom of which there was a, a metal grid and that was illuminated from uh, from the below. Uh, and we, we whatever the, the image, uh, the tiny lens created, we observed using the uh, Microsoft object objective. And this is the result. So imagine that you would have a, a, a cup, cup with uh, black walls and there would be a pattern at the bottom and just you would look inside, that's what you would see. Uh, and this is quite amazing because this, lens, this, this image is created by a lens that is uh, 100 micrometers in diameter. That's just to give you perspective, human hair is approximately 60, 70 microns. So it's a really, really tiny lens and it can create a quite uh, amazing image. So we decided to um, check the quality of the image, how it changes depending on the immersion medium. So we put them in, in two different ones, uh, one which is uh, of established uh, value for uh, adult fish, uh, it's the osmolality of the body fluids, uh, so it's 320 milliosmos. And uh, during our uh, preliminary study, we found out that uh, a lower osmolality of 240 milliosmos works a little bit better. And if you uh, if you will see at the end of this uh, animation look, you see that the uh, image on the right is uh, a slightly better quality, uh, final quality than the image on the left. Uh, we decided, of course, to quantify uh, this data, not just to show uh, blurry images in paper. Uh, so uh, what we did, we uh, made a Fourier analysis. So we basically analyzed the intensity profile across this bar, and then we uh, each every signal you can always represent as a sum of sinuses, and then you just look at the uh, sinuses that represent the frequency you're looking for, and then we were observing how the magnitude of this frequency is. Uh, is decreasing with time. Uh, I will just uh, maybe straight to result because it will be a little bit uh, clear. So what we, uh, at the end of, of all this uh, uh, complicated analysis, we came up with with graph which represents the uh, relative image quality. So now the important <coughs> things you need to notice is that the, the graph doesn't start uh, at time zero because uh, you can never just, just open a fish eye and start measurement because you always need to prepare it, you need to put it to the next setup. So there was always some delay between um, measurements and during that time, the lens was exposure to, to, the, to the medium. So we had to take this into account. So we always measured the time. Some of the lenses were rejected if the time was too long. Um, but at the end, we, we just chose a certain, uh, certain time to put all the lenses in. Uh, we needed to crop the data, so each data point, each data time will have uh, data points in every data set. Uh, it's, I know it's very complicated and we even have a dedicated graph explaining that in a, in a paper. Uh, but at the end, uh, we normalize it to the first frame in a data set and that we said, okay, this is our quality. So each next frame, we're gonna compare the quality of that frame to the original frame. And this is why we get this, this decline. So the image will uh, decrease as you saw in the previous animation. And as you can see, uh, 240 milliosmos uh, decreases the quality much slower and it ends up on a much lower level. 
And I get questioned a lot that, okay, if the osmolality is perfectly matched, shouldn't this be flat, uh, that the quality will maintain the same? Well, it shouldn't, because you take out the lens from an organism, it's, it's going to die. It's not going to maintain its proper optical properties forever. So the time itself will affect the lens and will affect the quality. So that's why we decided to look at the, at the rate of decrease rather than just uh, just the decrease of quality. Uh, because we wanted to angle this story of osmolality for, for people who work with larvae, so uh, they use a lot of fixation, and we wanted to argue that maybe you should uh, take into account osmolality of the fixative that you're using. So we thought, okay, let's just do that. Just use this osmolality and actually uh, fix, fix the entire larvae. Uh, we, of course, were looking just at the eyes because that's, our, uh, that's in, it's in our interest. Uh, so two things which you can observe here is the uh, uh, marked with magenta line is the uh, overall shape of the cornea. It's done because the, the contrast is typically very poor. So uh, it's, it's basically guiding your eyes so you know what's the, the general shape and the thickness of the, of the cornea, sorry, of the retina uh, in, in the fish uh, eye. So as you see, uh, the cornea uh, for 240 millions is, is much more smooth and it's stretched. It's something we would expect. As Linda showed you, the cornea is typically, uh, well, it, it doesn't look like this. <laughs> Maybe we'll put it this way. And every single picture of a, a fixed fish eye of, of larvae we saw had this, that the cornea was completely folded and nobody ever thought about. Maybe that's not the way you shape an image. So, so we thought that something is wrong there. Uh, and you can see that there's a, there's a pattern that the higher osmolality, uh, the more folded the cornea is. And also because of the, uh, of the effect of osmolality, the eye itself is getting uh, smaller because of the water being sucked out. Uh, and as a consequence, we have the shrinkage of the, uh, of the retina. And we also measured that. So you can see that uh, the, the variation between thickness is very small. But uh, this white bars here is the 95% confidence interval. So they, they vary very little, but there's obviously a difference between those three different thicknesses. Uh, you can clearly identify. So to conclude this project, if you want to work with uh, adult fish, yes, of course, you can still use uh, 320 degree osmos. If it works perfectly, we, we use it ourselves. But if you work with a larvae, it is very likely that the larvae have lower osmolality of their body fluids. Uh, because of their uh, because of their size, so the uh, surface to volume ratio is unfavorable for them. So it is likely that uh, in order to balance the uh, difference of osmolality between their body and the environment, in this case it would be fresh water, so the uh, osmolality would be around zero. Uh, so to, to in order to kind of decrease the difference that they would need to uh, compensate for, uh, they probably have much lower osmolality. Uh, we tested zebrafish uh, larvae, but it is very likely that because of the size, uh, it also affects other larvae too. Um, yeah. So the last project, last but not least, uh, cell thickness measurement. So uh, that's my baby, my favorite one. Uh, so why why would we in general measure the the fiber thickness? Uh, it's about how lenses are growing. So uh, as Linda mentioned, the lenses are growing by putting, uh, putting new fibers on top of the old ones. And uh, there's a consequence of that, because if you want to maintain the optics throughout the time when the lens is developing, uh, you need to keep up the uh, refractive index, which is basically corresponding to, um, to optical properties. So if you will imagine that you have a uh, spherical uh, lens that is, uh, uh, that is in, in fish eye, uh, and we will look at specific one uh, growth shell, so just one one layer of cells. And uh, let's say that this is the one marked on the screen. Uh, if we want to see how it's going to change throughout the life, so yeah. let's add some figure. Uh, we still stay with the with the uh, with, with the way of showing data, which is normalized to uh, lens radius. Uh, zero is the center. Uh, one R is the periphery, is the surface of the lens. As you can see. So, um, as uh, Avlinda said, the uh, lenses are uh, having gradients in refractive index. In fish, it is approximately parabolic shape. It's just, uh, yeah, for purpose of the presentation, let's say that this is the, uh, this is the accurate, uh, value, uh, accurate uh, curvature. Uh, so, the refractive index is very high in the center, uh, and then it drops to, to the periphery uh, in, in approximately parabolic manner. 
So now, if you, uh, if we will look at the this this one layer that we were observing, uh, it will have very low volume of rest index. That red dot shows the intersection of uh, of 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 the position, fixed position of the layer, and the refractive index curve. So now I'm going to uh, play an animation of lens growing. So please observe what happens on the intersection. So because the lens is growing, the refractive index will need to kind of keep up. And uh, this fiber is immobile because it doesn't go anywhere. Uh, so if you see that uh, when the lens is growing, you see that this fiber, to keep up this profile that's being stretched, it has to increase the refractive index somehow. Uh, or just, just for those of you who missed, uh, if you increase it, uh, this is kind of stretched because it's a relative measure, uh, and this this layer that is fixed needs to increase the refractive index. Uh, so in order to increase the refractive index, uh, the, the fibers, uh, lens fiber cells are, are uh, creating it uh, by simple mixture, well, not simple, but by mixture of uh, water and proteins. Uh, so if you want to increase the refractive index, you can either increase the amount of proteins or decrease the amount of water. And that creates uh, three different possible scenarios. So if you will take water away from the from the cell, we would expect that the cell will shrink. Uh, when you will move the proteins inward, then they will dissolve, and we expect that the cells will uh, not change their uh, size. And of course, there will be something uh, in between, so a little bit of water le uh, leaving the cell and some proteins moving in, uh, making the, the cell shrink, but, but not as much as in the uh, compaction hypothesis. So as you can see, it's uh, very easy to kind of identify which of the scenarios uh, we're dealing with just by measuring the cell thickness. And then uh, if it's one of those two scenarios, uh, then we, we would need to uh, put some other uh, other extra tests to, to find out which of the two. But the first step would be to actually measure the cell thickness. Uh, unfortunately, there was absolutely no method to do it for fish lenses because they are uh, so hard, they're, they're, they, their refractive is, is so uh, high in the center that they are extremely hard and you cannot really dissect them because they, they, uh, they basically shut them. So I had to develop a method, which I did, and uh, I really regret that I summarized this tough job in just one sentence. But we measured the uh, cell thicknesses uh, of, uh, of, we started with one species with Nile tilapia, uh, which is 25 individuals, and divided them to different groups of different lens sizes. And uh, we measured thickness. So that's what you see here. It's expressed in micrometers. And here we have four different uh, categories or four different positions of which we measure. So uh, we measured in the 20, 40, 60, and 80% radius. Uh, and at those four different locations, uh, uh, yes, the data is, uh, it's a box plot, so it's basically it's like, almost like a raw data. We are showing you what we measured without any uh, cover up with, with statistics. Uh, so all the boxes represent 50% of all the, all the data. That's where all the 50% uh, of all, all the measurements from this spot is within this small box. So there are three things you can uh, observe here is that uh, there's almost no difference between uh, uh, between the radial positions that they all seem to be uh, overlapping quite largely. Uh, that there is basically no difference between small and large lenses that they are large and few lenses. They are still overlapping quite largely. Um, so the difference between small and big, there's there's almost none. There's no difference between radial positions. And also the overall uh, thickness, the average thickness, is, is quite low. It's around 0 0.8 micron, uh, which is um, quite surprising because that gray region you see, this is approximately the region of, uh, of visible light, at least for fish. Uh, so, so you see that plenty of cells will be within the uh, visible uh, light range uh, when it comes to size, uh, which is something we, we did not expect because there's uh, many things that can go wrong, optically speaking. Uh, so we decided after, after this uh, interesting uh, discovery to, uh, to include more species. So we added eight more species and we repeated also the Nautilapia. Uh, oh, this is not really great here. Uh, but you can open, if you have pieces, you can open page 45. It's figure number 10. Uh, so as you see, uh, basically all the species. Uh, so here we changed a little bit our strategy. So we didn't measure at four specific points. We actually uh, decided to go as close to the center as possible and then just start measuring along the radius. 
uh, wherever it is possible. And, uh, and that's the result. So that's why you have this kind of uh, cloud of points uh, of measurement. And you see that uh, most fish, uh, they have the, the, the relatively flat profile, meaning that the thickness does not depend on the radial position. So here uh, on the left, again, center of the lens, and here on the right is the uh, lens periphery, lens surface. Uh, and here, of course, the micrometers as the, uh, as the thickness. So this basically suggested that uh, in all those nine species, there is there's no variation between thickness. So we thought, well, this really strongly points to toward the, the transport hypothesis. Uh, so we decided to, OK, what should we observe if it is compaction hypothesis? If, it's, if it is actually, if the fish regulate the refractive index of their lens fiber cells by uh, decreasing water from some, by removing it, what should we observe? What kind of profile? So this is what, what we did with the modeling here. So uh, we looked at the, uh, at the fibers very close to the center, and we, 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 we prefer model, nine models for each of the, I mean, no, one model for each of the nine species. Um, and we, we just look at the closest position and the average thickness in this region, and we said, okay, this is, this is a fiber that we're gonna, we're gonna model. And we, want, we wanted to see how this fiber was changing in time. Like we, we kind of model it uh, in reverse. So when you remember this animation, when I was uh, increasing the lens and the refractive index was increasing, then we kind of modeled the opposite. So we were decreasing the lens and then decreasing the refractive index. So when we were decreasing the refractive index, we were wondering, okay, so uh, if the refractive index is smaller, how much water do I need to add? which means how much water the cell lost in the past uh, in order to, to, to balance the refractive index. And, and this is the curve we achieved. So here is not actually position, but more it's more about relative position. So if this fiber uh, in the lens we measured was here, uh, in the past, it used to be very close to the surface. So when it was close to the surface, so when it was at 90% gradient, so very close, uh, it's supposed to have this kind of thickness to in order to reach this value after uh, after its development. Uh, note that the modeling we did is extremely conservative and works against us. So, for example, one of the assumptions we did is that uh, the refractive index of cells is uh, is equal to that of pure water, which is ridiculous. But even with that assumption, uh, the model uh, predicted that the cell which would have to shrink. Uh, over 66% of its uh, of its size to to reach uh, the value that we could actually measure, which is quite uh, unreasonable because we should observe these kind of changes, uh, whether at different uh, radial positions or uh, among different sizes between small or large lenses. There is no um, such difference visible. So to conclude, uh, we compared actually sorry we compared actually the the average thicknesses uh, that all of them were very small, they were uh, way to, below one micron. And uh, what is even more interesting, they were all very, very low comparing to other vertebrates that were investigated, so mouse, uh, cattle, rabbits, and uh, chickens. Um, so that was also uh, quite interesting why the, the fibers are, are so uh, thin. The, the overall pattern of uh, thickness being independent from radial position uh, was uh, was similar with the with the other vertebrates, so at least uh, this was this was similar. But the overall value was much smaller, which points out that it is very likely that uh, fish regulates their uh, refractive index by transporting proteins inwards uh, to the cell. So that's uh, basically all. Uh, so when I started this PhD project uh, five years ago as an engineer. My knowledge of biology was very. Um, <laughs> I, I hope that now I've, I've, I, I hope I demonstrated after five years of studying fish lenses, at least I can learn some biology. Um, <laughs> so yeah, thank you very much for your time. So thank you very much, Thomas. Uh, now, Linda, the floor is yours.
Yes. Thank you for a very nice presentation. I think Before my great introduction. <laughs> I think I think that my knowledge on, on the fish is about where where you showed there. <laughs> <laughs> but I will try to do my best and have you help me understanding better sure. about the fish. So my first question is really basic regarding I understand why you go to animals to under, to look at the how the lens uh, is growing and how the what the anatomical properties determines the optical properties. Yeah. But why the fish? Why the fish model? Why why not any other animal? I mean, it, you could really easily uh, answer that right away from it's easier to to get something right right from the from the start. But actually, what is interesting about fish is how the the general optical model is, how how simple it is. When you describe a human eye, you had the corn, you had lens, you had uh, aspherical surfaces and compensation, and here. The model is very simple. There's basically no cornea when it comes to optics. There's just one lens that does all the refraction, and it's it's a perfect sphere almost. Uh, so the modeling of it is much easier, and it actually allows to um, to investigate certain properties that we cannot do with the same precision uh, with other other lenses. It's mostly about the uh, investigation of refractive index distribution, which uh, which is like it's very often it's a missing piece that allows us to study for the, the thickness or, uh, or or growth. And that is possible thanks to the uh, simple geometry of, uh, of fish lenses that allow certain mathematical uh, operations that other shapes do not. Yeah, because with the fish eye, you can actually, or the fish lens, you can actually give a, make an accurate model. Well, can't yeah, you? Yeah. That is actually predicting, and yes. totally correct, yeah, and yeah. still predicting optical quality. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that you, it's very tricky in some other species. Exactly. It's tricky. Um, yeah, you mentioned there, because there are some things that are very different from, from the human eye and the human lens. Uh, especially I was thinking about regarding cataract. Yeah. Do, lens, do fish get yeah. cataract? Yes, they do. They, uh, we, we didn't really look into, into this part of, uh, uh, of the lens property. But uh, it is known that, uh, that I think fish farmers of some of them, they complain of and that uh, fish get cataract and uh, uh, that decrease their uh, ability to feed. Uh, but uh, so yeah, it's it's a it's a thing that happens too. Uh, but I guess it's uh, as I recall, the cataract often happens because the uh, proteins are being uh, like packed together uh, and they scatter light and. Um, Fish has is very rich in, in uh, uh, gamma crystallins, which are very uh, good in packing, but not very good in in, uh, in collecting together in class. I don't remember the, the, the technical term for this. Aggregation. Sorry. Aggregation. Oh, yes, thank you. Aggregation. Mm -hmm. uh, so they don't aggregate that uh, the same to the same level as uh, as other proteins, and maybe that's why this uh, cataracting fish is less common than. But it still uh, can happen. Okay, so it's less common, but it does occur yeah. because of age-related changes or because of uh, other circumstances? Uh, that I don't know. I know that uh, that was potentially when uh, this project was, was still at, the, at its uh, beginning when we thought the method would work very well, which it didn't. Uh, <laughs> we were actually hoping that maybe we could establish a connection and, and uh, look a little bit more into details for uh, cataracts and, and how to save industry and some production. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So what do you think you can learn from the fish eye? I mean, what, 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 I mean, apart from yeah, the yeah, modeling? Yeah, from, from yeah. humans. Yes. So well, back. we always uh, need to remember that whatever we uh, investigate in other models of, or other animals that not necessarily is directly trans uh, translatable. But in this case, uh, we just found something that uh, was difficult to, to, would be difficult to discover in other species. Uh, so it's interesting that, okay, now we have a piece of knowledge that uh, this works with fish. So now when you work with human eyes, you have some additional piece of information that you can work around. So you can try to design our experiments or maybe find a way to go around the, the problem of uh, refractive index distribution and, and the measuring it and, um, and, and, and try to test it in the way. Because before that, we, as, you, as you mentioned, of course, but our foundation is very deep that we, we don't know certain things and now uh, we have an extra piece of information that worked in fish, so now it's a, it's a doubt of maybe it works also in humans, so that's mm -hmm. something worth investigation. So uh, just that is, is, I think, quite interesting to, to learn from, from fish. Mm -hmm. 
this is something that you already know now that that is the case for the fish, but not the case for the for the human eye. Well, we didn't test the human eyes. So no, but is, is there something that you that you know from before? Sorry, what, what no, but is there something that is known that is a process process that only occurs in in the in the, fish, in, in eye, the fish, but not in the human eye? Well, multifocality would be one, I guess. Now we don't have multifocal lenses, <laughs> unfortunately. That would be great. Um, but uh, yeah, that's uh, they, they are they are a little bit different. And then, sorry, fish lenses are a little bit different. Right? Hmm. Yeah, I would like to ask one more general thing before going sure. into the details. Uh, we had talked about a lot about refractive power now um, and refractive index, but we haven't said what refractive index is. Oh boy, uh, sure, <laughs> yeah. Well, refractive index is basically, I don't know how deep should I go with this. Oh, you choose. It's basically, <laughs> it basically is the ability of medium to refract, uh, refract light. And uh, from an optics perspective, it's mostly the um, the difference between uh, it's it's the border between two different um, it's a border between media of two different refractive indices. That's why uh, le that's why cornea underwater or the cornea of fish underwater doesn't work because the refractive index in front and behind cornea and of cornea is very similar, very matched. So that's why there, there is basically no uh, no difference that could affect the uh, the path of light. Whereas in our lenses, we are exposed to light, uh, sorry, to air. And the refractive index of air is around one, uh, whereas the, the refractive of, uh, index of the cornea and of the uh, body is much higher. Uh, that's why we have all the refractive power, which again we lose when we dive underwater, and that's why we have uh, really poor vision when we dive without any goggles to put this thin layer of air in front. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so that's that's the basic uh, basic principle of refractive is basically the ability of, of uh, refracting light. Yeah, what happens to light when it enters? I mean, it slows down, basically. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's what happens. But that's the, that's physics. <laughs> <laughs> that's not make people leave. <laughs> <laughs> it basically slows, okay. uh, it's, it's, it's one interpretation of the refractive index is basically that the kind of light bounces between them so that it takes a longer path. So very often you can, um, when you work with refractive index, you can uh, you can talk about optical path, which is the geometrical path, the distance that light travels, multiplied by a refractive index. And that's why uh, you don't have to kind of think about what specific environment light goes through. You calculate the optical paths. And then that's a very important, especially for uh, interferometers, for example, when you, uh, when you want to make the arms of interferometer, uh, the face to be, to be overlapping, you want to make exactly the same uh, optical path. And that's why whenever you introduce some of the things, you need to take this into uh, account. Okay. Yeah. I think the concept of that it slows down light is a very nice uh, way to, to understand what's happening. So when the, when the light actually, and when the rays comes and enters a surface that is oblique somehow to the, to the entering light, the rays that are coming first would start going slower than the rays that come in yeah. later, and then the whole beam will bend. It's, it's much clearer so it's... To, to demonstrate when you actually show the, uh, the wave front, because then it's actually, you can see that, okay, this part is slower, this one is still traveling, and then you actually see that if you will put a, a flat wave front, and you will start drawing it yourself, you can actually see how it's curved, and then you will see that it's, it's mm -hmm. really great mm -hmm. to actually see it uh, in this way. Yeah. So what material properties is it that that constitutes the, I mean, in the lens now, so we concentrate on the lens. Yeah. What material properties is it that kind of sets the refractive index? That's the protein concentration. Uh, but the two, uh, you mean the interaction with light? No, I don't know. Yeah, I guess it's it's just the, the, the because the proteins are dissolved in water. So they, uh, they basically have a solution which has higher refractive index. But if you mean that, if you, if you ask about more, uh, on uh, atomic level than I, or molecular level than I, I don't really know about the interaction. I was looking more of uh, the concept of refractive index rather than uh, specific uh, interactions and in what is happening. No, I'm happy with the more general. Right. <laughs> and as you already mentioned, there are different crystallines. Yes. 
that yeah. can reflect differently. Uh, well, they have, yeah, I mean, they, um, it's basically about how much uh, how much concentration do you need to reach a certain uh, refractive index. And uh, typically in, in vertebrate lenses, we have uh, alpha, beta, and gamma uh, crystallines, but there are many others. There are some taxon specific uh, uh, refractive, uh, sorry, uh, the crystallines, uh, which have different refractive index increment, which is the, the property of uh, how much concentration affects you. So that's why uh, in fish, you will see a lot of, of gamma crystallines, which have high uh, refractive index increment, which means that get smaller changes in, in concentration, increase the, uh, the refractive index much to much more, uh, higher extent. And, uh, but also this causes the, uh, the lenses to be, to be so hot. So for example, uh, lenses of, uh, lenses that needs to be flexed for accommodation that you mentioned. So fish, uh, fish is sneaky and they're just doing it by physically moving the fish, the, the, the lens, uh, closer to, um, for the, for to the, uh, retina. Uh, they do not. They do not uh, flex it, so that they, that's why they don't care about the uh, that the lenses are, are so hard. Whereas in uh, other species, for example, birds, when they need to have high flexibility or high uh, ability of accommodation, they actually have uh, very little or no gamma crystalline because the lens moved too hard and they couldn't flex it. Properly. That's really so how much of the alpha and the beta crystallines do, that does the fish have? Uh, there is very little actually study to, uh, to, to actual distribution. I think I found just one uh, investigation, but that investigation reaches half of the, of, of the, half of the ranges basically. And then I believe that it's a limit of the method because then suddenly there's like, okay, there's no other crystallines. There's just, uh, uh, unsolvable uh, crystallines there, which is kind of weird. Like it's a black box, basically. Like, we don't know what's beyond that, that point. Um, but to that fifty percent radius, the, um, the there was uh, alpha and uh, beta crystallines, and what was actually interesting is that they were uh, on the similar level throughout the the radius, mm -hmm. uh, and they conclude from that study that uh, it's not only the uh, amount of crystallines, but it's also some form of interactions between them uh, that would affect the refractive changes. Uh, as I said, in the model, we, we made a, a more conservative assumption. So we assume the the, uh, the best possible scenario to to increase the refractive index fast. So that's why we concentrate it just on the crystal, mm -hmm. on gamma crystalline. And we, we said, okay, there's no other, uh, there are no other crystallines because it would, uh, yeah, it would make the model a little bit weaker. Because just, we wanted to see if, if the model with uh, so conservative uh, predictions and uh, which are basically not realistic, if this already can kind of uh, show our point, then it's likely that more realistic model, which is less advantageous, uh, would actually be the case. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, I was wondering about this with the gamma proteins uh, or the crystal gamma crystallines, uh, what they are, because uh, could they be the the reason why it's less common with cataract and fish than it is in in humans? Uh, it's possible uh, because it's mm -hmm. uh, I, I've read somewhere that it's uh, yeah the, the high refractive index uh, increment is also kind of linked to the uh, ability let's say to to aggregate. So mm -hmm. um, I mean it's reverse. So the gamma crystalline is, is aggregating less. So yes. it could be the, the reason why uh, why the cataract there is less common. And, uh, yeah, but it's I guess it requires a bit more. more mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, talking about aggregation of, of how do how do what are the what are the specific features of the lens that makes it so transparent apart uh, from avoiding aggregation of proteins? Well, I think that the, uh, the most important is that they uh, they broke down the, their organelles uh, completely. Uh, they basically they, they only keep some layer uh, several layers of cells that are still metabolically active they still have organelles uh, in in fish it's, uh, it's uh, like three percent away from the radius I think I don't remember the numbers and uh, there is actually uh, all the organelles and what is interesting that the entire zone which the uh, uh, which the fibers are, are active they the, the refractive index is constant there so it's very 
very low, but uh, constant. Uh, we believe that this is kind of the, the, the minimum that is possible to reach. Beyond that, the, the cell wouldn't, uh, it needs a certain uh, amount of protein to, to survive. Uh, but everything beyond that point, uh, and it's the day that all the cells broke down their organelles, and uh, uh, it's actually a very rapid process. So when you uh, when you study, for example, lenses so, uh, of terrestrial, because the fish pupil is, is very large, basically uh, it doesn't cover, almost like it doesn't cover the, the lens in other animals when the, the pupil is actually uh, covering more and it's, it's changing uh, its size. You can observe that the layer uh, when the fibers with organelles start is basically right under the, the pupil. Is, is kind of uh, there's a limit of pupil, so this part already doesn't contribute to vision. So we can have uh, organelles, but the moment uh, fibers are start, well, fibers are starting to contribute to the vision, uh, they already broke down their organelles, and it's it happens within a uh, few layers that they they start breaking the organelles by just uh, changing the shape of organelles and then just uh, and destroying them within a few layers. So it's a very uh, rapid process. Um, and even those, even the, the ones that do have the organelles there, uh, they are all moved to one place. So they will be just, uh, they're typically hanging out around the, the equator of the lens. So they're all kind of clustered together. So there will be just, okay, this is the, the, where we have organelles, but everything else is clear. Uh, and that's how they reach the transparency. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, we understood that in some species you can have the organelles. The organelles are kind of around the equator yeah. where you are covered by the pupil, which is covered by the pupil often. Yeah. So then you try to Just, avoid yes, them as exactly. much as possible. Have as little scattering as possible. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so looking at your, your first paper there, uh, you mentioned about you mentioned about the multifocality a bit, and, yeah. and could you go more into telling about what's the advantage and, and disadvantage of multifocality? And Absolutely. Yeah, waiting. you were waiting for that. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Yes. So, imagine you have a lens. Uh, this is an optical axis. Uh, so if it's a question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, we're looking at different regions of the lens again. Um, so if you will imagine that this is a perfect lens, so uh, we still uh, maintain the same amount of, I mean, maintain the same way of showing data. So this is center of the lens, and this is periphery. And this is the distance. So if you have a perfect lens, uh, all the light that comes from here, it bends the, the, the lens is bending in light, and they are all reaching the same point, that's the, the focal point. Uh, so if you will look at the, uh, you kind of plot it, uh, plot the, the same thing as I showed you with the uh, Atlantic and Polar Cron, so basically that's the graph. So uh, it's the distance at which light is spent depending on different positions. So that's approximately what you will see from a perfect uh, lens with no aberration. However, lenses are not perfect. As, as you mentioned about the spherical aberration, so this is what happens. The further you go away from the center, the more light is spent. Uh, and this will result with, with this kind of curve, so it will be a little bit uh, slighted. And so there are different uh, variations between uh, perfect black and this uh, slope. Uh, we can also introduce the, the chromatic aberration, uh, which is basically the uh, a property, let's say property, or aberration connected to materials. So uh, different uh, refractive, uh, different waves are are fed in different ways because basically there's a refractive index uh, depending on the wavelength, not not just general refractive index, but it's wave independent. So uh, shorter wavelengths are typically uh, focused much closer than the longer one. Uh, but as you see this this graph, what what the spherical or the chromatic aberration did is just basically took the same shape and just moved it along the uh, along this line. So it's basically the same shape. But it's so now if you imagine this, this wacky multifocal lens, uh, which has three different regions, so that is this region, this region, and this, and it will have all different refractive indices, uh, then you may end up with this kind of weird, uh, weird shape curve, which that would be the multifocality. At first, it doesn't look like this would help at all, but if you will add the spherical operation, for example, sorry, chromatic operation, uh, then it's getting even more messy, but you can actually find one region which is uh, one region away from the lens that has exactly all uh, three colors in this case, 
uh, concentrated on at one distance. So that's if you put retina there, you will have perfectly sharp image in uh, red, green, and blue. And those 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 wavelengths or those bar the bands are typically matched to uh, to the cones in the, in the retina. So that's why multifocality. Uh, this is how basically multifocality works uh, to compensate for uh, for for, for chromatic aberration. Mm -hmm. You know why the why did the the fish develop multifocality, or did the fish develop multifocality? Or did it came before that, or, Boy, or uh, <laughs> I don't know who was first. I don't want to make that. Uh, but they they have multifocality because um, they have a very short uh, they have a very small f number. So the the, uh, the focal length and uh, divided by the aperture um, is uh, this ratio is very small. So uh, this causes a shallow depth of focus, which means that uh, any single operation basically uh, very quickly deteriorates the vision a lot. Uh, so that's why they need to have very well compensated image for, for chromatic or spherical aberration. That if you would have a little bit uh, larger depth of focus, uh, you could kind of let some things slide. Uh, mm -hmm. You don't have to have perfect uh, perfect image. But in this case, it's it's so so small that uh, uh, any deviation will uh, will make this this vision not work. You so know, I guess that's why it's most common. Do you know the amount approximately? I mean, in the human eye, we usually say that's a 0.25 diopters of, of depth of focus, and well, uh, one diopter of chromatic aberration. No, I don't. I'm sorry, I don't think mm -hmm. I know the, the, the actual. Amount. I guess it depends also on, on the species. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we'll have different types of eyes, so it's hard to tell one one value. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was now you showed us the. Let's see if I say it right. Now you showed us kind of the laser scanning yes. results. Yeah. Uh, what would it look like when you do Shigiri photography? I mean, you show. Do you have that nice image? Yes, you sure. Oh. <laughs> I guess you were prepared for this. <laughs> uh, yes, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So tell us about the colors. Uh, yeah, that's the. I think that's the the, uh, the question people always have. That uh, does it mean that uh, this does this mean that this region. Uh, focuses one blue line and this region focuses red. No, it doesn't. It's um, this is more what I would say. This is this is more of a color coding for us. So uh, the it's more about the relative values of, or, or or distances between. So you see that, for example, those peaks uh, they are uh, focusing the same kind of wavelength, whereas this one focusing different one. So it's more about this about differences and and seeing uh, in relative measures, because this, uh, these colors are basically depending on uh, a little bit on the setup, uh, because uh, studio photography is basically, uh, you have, a, you have a, a, a pinhole at uh, approximately where you have the, uh, the, the focal length, and then everything that is a little bit slightly defocused in that region will be cut out. So that's why only the colors that are sharply focused in that particular spot uh, will, will show. That means that if you will move this focus and uh, move this pinhole, you can actually change the spot. So we always try to, to move it the way that uh, you will have uh, a wide center because the, the, the center is, is uh, typically will go through anyway. So that's why we always try to, um, to, to, to kind of adjust it to this, but you can always move back and forth. So it's, it's really hard to tell because we need to have a more physiological context of how far the retina is from the lens to actually detect, talk about a specific color. So those colors are, are basically color coding for us. It's not, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that this is the uh, region for blue. It means that it's region for shorter wavelength than this one, but we can't really uh, talk about colors specifically. But when you choose the location of this pinhole, yeah. you choose it based on we typically want to illuminate the entire lens, so that's that's the the, uh, the basic function. And then we always try to, to make this as uh, uh, as basically white, because that's where um, where you will have uh, beams coming uh, almost parallel to the uh, to the optical axis. So that's why we uh, a lot of light will, will go through a lot of waving. So that's why we try to uh, to always find this as a, as a, our spot uh, as a kind of point of reference. 
Yeah, for the sheaf ray, you're not expecting yeah. chromatic aberrations. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's why that's why we mm -hmm. talk about what you said. That's why it's it's more. I mean, you never can. It's very difficult to draw the conclusion just from this. That's why we always have uh, supporting graph, and it's also difficult to understand this graph without support of Schleyer. Mm -hmm. So that's why they are typically coming in pair. It's very uh, yeah. It's it's if you want to have more detailed analysis, you should look at this graph. But it's sometimes difficult to understand without uh, copies of Schleyer. Yes. Now this is showing multivocality in both states here, in the dark yeah. adapted and the light adapted. What would, just for reference, what would this Schlieren photography look like if you would have a monofocal lens? It would be just like, I mean, perfectly corrected, I assume. That would be well, like, with spherical aberration. Uh, with spherical aberration, <coughs> then it would just get dimmer, Because then basically you cut out the light. So that means you have a, do I have a spherical aberration? I mean, just a monofocal. I mean, if a monofocal lens with very yeah, collaboration, yeah. Yeah, with so longitudinal chromatic so aberration. If you would have mm -hmm. a, a pinhole here, so that that light would go through, but mm -hmm. uh, this light wouldn't, so it would be much less. So it, I guess it would get thin, uh, depending on how far you will, you will set it. But it's, yeah. yeah, whatever point you will set, that would be black bright, and then everything both ways would go different. That's how. But it would be uh, just one color. Also, if you have longitudinal chromatic aberration there? If you have chromatic aberration, then it would, uh, then you would, I think you would expect some kind of uh, a kind of rainbow, like uh, a kind of scan across the uh, whole, uh, basically the entire spectrum. That you, your camera can pick up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that was what I was thinking also. So, yeah. I, so when you go, if you go back to what you had there. So, what what is it that enables you to say that this is multifocality and not only a monofocal lens? Yeah, this one is, uh, is, is quite, I, I understand the computer, but mm -hmm. typically you see that there, there are like very distinct uh, bands. So for example, the color between the two bands are approximately the same, whereas this one is completely different. That's why we, um, that's why we, we, we say that there's a, a, a multifocality. And also you can see uh, just, just, just from this graph that it's, it's going back and forth. Yeah, also yes. would, would help. So you may not necessarily feel that it's like multifocal because it always feels like it's a, it's a scan across the colors. But uh, this graph helps you a little bit more. Uh, and I think that the uh, the polarcoding has it more a bit more clear because here you have very distinct bands here. And I think that I don't know if I have the. Uh, uh, yeah, it's the well. Actually, if you will look on the uh, multifocality from uh, from my cover, uh, that's actually yeah, there is a, there uh, this is this is drawn, but it's a reproduction from uh, from one of the images I had. Uh, so then you actually you can actually observe this, and that's obviously multifocal. That's that's a little bit clearer that there's something uh, funny happening. You see that it's going back and forth. If yeah, it would yeah. have been only longitudinal chromatic aberration, there it would be, as you said, it would be a rainbow-like structure, exactly, yeah. not shifting back and forth. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Those are yes. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Yeah, and it was I was fascinated to read about this placidity, placidity both uh, from the retina as well as as of, of the lens. Um, how? What is it that's happening, especially in the lens? What? what you mean the, the, yeah, what is changing so quickly? Uh, the refractive index, basically, they, they somehow adapt the, the it's typically the peripheral uh, region when mm -hmm. uh, I guess the cells are more metabolically active. So they actually um, they actually change a little bit more uh, monofocal during night because they they switch to the uh, remote vision, and then you have just one uh, basically one. Uh, Sensitivity. So, so what, what are what are they changing? Are they changing their shape? Are they changing their basically yeah, if you, if you look concentration? At the, uh, no, no, no. If you, they they changing the refractive index distribution. For the simple, that's all. Right? They don't change the shape. But uh, if you change that uh, the curve that I was showing on the mm -hmm. let me call it blur, but they basically they they just trying to make the make it more flat. So it will be as perfect one focal uh, lens because if you have just one. Uh, 
uh, just just rods that picking up uh, all the light, and you want to match their sensitivity, and that's why it's uh, it's yeah, it's uh, compensating for the fact that just moving, making monofocal lens and uh, concentrating everything in that view. So are they are they making more proteins? Uh, exactly, and I I don't I don't think it's enough actually. Uh, you... I know that it's it's uh, as I recall it was dopamine that was triggering that, but uh, I don't really know what is the. I mean, I, I, judging from the study we did, it's probably the proteins uh, moving back and forth, but mm -hmm. the, it needs to be done really precisely. I mean, there is uh, there is research showing that even tiny changes of uh, refractive index uh, distribution they they can change you know multifocal monofocal and uh, multifocal that doesn't work so. Very tiny changes uh, can can have a gigantic influence on optics. Uh, so the exact mechanism, I don't think it's known. Uh, so it's hard to tell. But you we, can, we can just mm -hmm. see the result of, of the of the, of the changes uh, when it's more. Uh, but what you're seeing here is that it's not, at least not the lens as such that is changing its shape. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The lens is uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it's the shape. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Um, you said they had some unpublished results also on the. Yeah, that was the that, that was us. the difference between the uh, polar cod during polar day and polar night. Yes. That they actually mm -hmm. uh, that there is actually a difference as to uh, lenses. Do you do you know if they also have this retinal motor movements, just as uh, a Atlantic cod? I don't remember if they do have because I don't think we started. We, we didn't study really retina because we didn't have. Uh, um, we were we, we had what we concentrated on the lenses and when you extract mm -hmm. them, you want to uh, sometimes make them pass so they will not start dying, as I mentioned. Uh, so we very often scarred the uh, retina. So I don't think we actually looked into that whether they can have uh, retinal movement. Because okay. it was mentioned for the Atlantic card, as yeah. far as I understood here. That has been shown that there is something. What is it that is yes. moving actually? No, no. You mean in the in the Atlantic cod, uh, in the retina. In, in the retina. In the retina. Well, basically, you have you don't have enough space, so uh, you you move the uh, you move the rods uh, behind, and then they just switch positions to, uh, to mm -hmm. yeah, replace each other when they uh, when they meet. And it takes some an hour or an hour. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so that, that's the, that's the movement. Okay, but it's not known where it exists in the polar cut. Well. Uh, in po I don't think it, the polar cut is really uh, studied. That's that's the point. Oh, I see. Okay. The region is quite difficult to uh, to get the sample, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think much is known about. It was the as I recall, it's the first time we actually uh, know something about optics and polar cut. So yeah, mm -hmm. difficult fish to catch. Good. Uh, then we move on to, to paper number two. Uh, and uh, I was first, uh, it's very nice to see that you found a, a kind of a new way to measure osmolality. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and using optical quality measurements, that's something that is often, that is very often done with, with cameras. I mean, when characterizing lenses, yes. objective lenses. How does your method of, of Quantifying the optical quality of, of these lenses correlate to what you do, what what the industry does for objectives, objective lenses. Uh, I don't think I understand the question. You mean the, how we measure the quality? Uh, well, we, yeah. we simply looked at the. Uh, it's it's a little bit of glorified contrast measurement because uh, that's what uh, um, what the intensity. I mean, we studied the, the we made a fast Fourier transform of the intensity profile. And because it's um, because of the, the, the nature of the signal, and um, that's basically because we, we chose the pattern which is black and white, black and white, mm -hmm. uh, as, as as you see on the in the figure. Uh, that's basically the measurement of contrast between uh, the, the the bright and the dark uh, part. Uh, however, this is more robust to uh, to noise to uh, uneven illumination. Uh, because if you uh, the you pick a point, you either have to measure specifically on the pixel, which you know you will have some noise, uh, or you need to make some kind of averaging, which also can, can go 
wrong if you will uh, choose a point too close to the edge. Whereas this is a little bit more robust because it looks at a function in general and how this function is changing. Mm -hmm. So if the illumination is uh, uneven, it will remain uneven and then the changes will be uh, not. So that's why, uh, yeah, Fourier, Fourier transform is the way to go. Mm -hmm. Do you know how that is very similar to what, what is done in camera lenses? Uh, well, the camera lenses, they, they typically are shown as the uh, uh, contrast transfer function. Yeah. Am I not, um, yeah, modulation transfer points? function. Modulation mm -hmm. function, yes. Mm -hmm. So they basically, uh, they provide uh, very similar, uh, similar right? so they, they show what is the frequency and what is the corresponding contrast that you can transfer with the lens. And then you typically to simplify it, you, you make some kind of cap of uh, I'm dropping the object to fifty percent, and that's how you talk about the, the quality of uh, of that system. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know how they measure the the modulation transfer function in those uh, cases? Oh boy, I don't remember that. Uh, it is, isn't it? By Fourier, I think I, I would do it before. It's, it's, yeah. it's very similar to what you're describing yeah. here. I, I, I actually don't remember what you say. I, I, no, I haven't done this. Yeah, I would, I would go with Fourier. <laughs> Fourier is the way to go. <laughs> They're doing a very similar thing to what you're doing. I mean, this, yeah. the, the standard way to measure the, the optical quality of a lens is that you take a photo of a known pattern. Uh, the pattern they are using is also, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's black and white. Yeah. Uh, but you usually only have one edge oriented a bit on the diagonal. Okay. So you're covering. Well, yeah, you want to cut the diagonal because you have pixels at the end. Yeah. That's why you do it. Uh, and then you do it for a transform. Okay. I thought you actually meant the, the, um, those boards that you have. That's, uh, but I think this is more for uh, uh, visual confirmation whether you you like the lens or not, which is like uh, they have a lot of different like, uh, circles and uh, different patterns. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I yeah. That, no. Yeah. No. Yeah. no, this is more the physical. Yeah, so it's more uh, yeah, industrial. Yeah, there's only one difference between their met that method and what you're doing now, I think. It's because they do one advantage. Because you say you're average, you say you go along this line. Yes. Because you don't want to have the noise in. in, in yeah, you yeah. want to be less dependent on the yeah, noise yeah. and the illumination over the image. Yeah. They do even one step more further than what you're doing. Well, I, I would say that they actually, I also just looked at one frequency, so I'm sure that they are doing the entire suite. Yeah, so yeah, that's yeah. Well. Uh, but what do you what, what do you need to do today? Yeah, they are, they need to measure contrast in order to break. But you, should you, they have sweep of frequencies too? You like don't you don't need that if you have a sharp <laughs> edge. If you have a sharp edge, you have all frequencies in that sharp edge. Yeah, so you true, don't need that. Um, but you do it one dimensionally. Right. Right. Yes. Oh yeah, okay. Whereas that's they can they can use the full image. So that's, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, but because they all they care also about the the entire lens of this. Uh, we were here looking at just uh, the effects, mm -hmm. not not specifically to quality, but to uh, quantify the, the quality of the entire lens. Just uh, just as effect. But yeah, that's yeah. That's true. No, I think you found a very nice a very nice way to to look at the to look at the osmolarity in in a very different way. And there might be that you can even use some commercial existing techniques to to do this. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you talked about uh, uh, the fixation and that it was challenging. I mean, it, how apart from the osmolality, mm -hmm. is there something else that that one has to take? I mean, I don't know anything about this part. This is really where I'm out in deep water. Right. What 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 should, do you need to think about when you fixate the lens? Uh... What are the challenges? Well, you need to find a, the, the, the proper solution, but it's uh, it's quite well established here, to be mm -hmm. fair. So you don't really need to experiment that much. Uh, basically, you need to start thinking about how to change it if you see that something goes wrong. That's basically how uh, that's how how it works. Um, but yeah, I mean the the osmolality is um, what I found it quite interesting is that when I started this project, uh, I I was going through some uh, textbooks on, on histology and. Uh, every single one mentioned how important osmolality is and how it's important to match osmolality of the tip and uh, and the tissue. And then not a single paper I read mentioned osmolality in the fixative. They always say 
this is what we fixed it and that's all. And then there's absolutely no reference to what is the fixed cosmology of the, of the tissue, what is the cosmology of the, um, of the fixed of it. Uh, so everyone knows it's important. Everyone knows that it affects the sample and nobody cares. So that's, that's what's my impression from uh, literature survey. Um, so that's why I, I decided to, uh, to, to at least try it, make it work. Um, and I assume that people will not, uh, I was a little bit worried when we were submitting this paper that people may not be happy with uh, with the fact that we are uh, yeah, kicking in the doors to, to well-established field of zebrafish research with their fixatives and so on. Um, but they seem to understand that maybe, at least for vision, that it's, uh, that it's quite unreasonable to accept the coordinate that is folded. And this is not something we can observe in nature nowhere, basically. Um, so that's why we, we would argue that it's, uh, that's why the data morality is, is, is actually important, especially for small tissues. Mm -hmm. like, uh, when the changes are happening very, uh, very fast. Yeah, but there's mm -hmm. plenty of things you need to take about temperature, for example, that you should right. fix things mm -hmm. in a low temperature to make sure that they fix properly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I like how uh, this is an engineer talk about uh, fixation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe we should leave that topic. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I was wondering more about, but with osmality, is there any connection with with protein concentration and refractive index uh, osmality, or I are they not, independent? Not, not, I, don't, I don't think there's a. Like, but, uh, I, we could, I would assume that the uh, osmo, the protein concentration affects with at least doesn't affect osmolality because uh, I think it would be very difficult to make a gradient if uh, if there would be uh, some osmotic pressure between them because then would be instantly just reducing back to to everything is equal. Uh, so I don't think that's uh, the crystallines that we uh, are mostly interested. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. So then we move on to paper three and four. First, tell us about this this method, method that oh, you said or, one shot and well yes I, well, a few minutes only the point is, <laughs> the point is that I'm glad you asked <laughs> now, the point is that, that we actually I actually developed two methods because uh, the first part, first time we, we tried there was some rumors how to do it uh, some people tried it didn't work I decided that I will, I will pick it up and try and uh, uh, I did a couple of samples and then finally it was a beautiful result that visualized it, it tells for the entire radius and it was Fantastic. Uh, and then I could not reproduce. When I was describing the, the methods for the manuscript, I could not reproduce it again. So I decided, well, we cannot really publish it because it's not reproducible. So that's, that's really uh, bad. So I just stepped in and um, around 60 samples later, so then three months of sitting in SEM and uh, doing very uh, tedious and depressing job, I, I managed another to develop another technique mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, that allow us to do visualization. It's a little bit, uh, well, it's, it's less beautiful. Uh, it's a little bit more uh, rough when it, uh, because you, you actually cut the um, the surface of the lens with, uh, that is embedded in plastic. Uh, you cut it with a high speed uh, saw. And what happens is basically it rips off parts of the, uh, of the lens and it doesn't allow any smearing between the cells. So that's why, uh, because if they're ripped, they, they can crack in. Uh, so when you have a long fiber, which basically breaks off. Uh, and this is why we, we can visualize them, but um, because it's very hard to control what is happening there, because it's so fast and, and, and violent, uh, it's not always possible to, to measure fibers across the entire radius. Sometimes you, you go and then, okay, this is smeared or something, you mm. can find another patch, and not all the, the uh, radial distances are available for measurement. So it's a, uh, it's a, uh, yeah, it's a little bit lower success rate when it comes to measuring the entire radius, uh, but it still allows us to, uh, yeah, to study all the black uh, lenses and uh, include all the uh, eight extra species. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, the method was, uh, yeah. so, so early, but earlier, if I understand right, the earlier we, the cutting has been made in this, at the slower speed and no, the, the, whole, well, the cutting was, uh, the cutting was done very similar way. Uh, it's just that it wasn't uh, uh, it was not the end of the process. So what we did after that, uh, I was then grinding off the surface with uh, with gradually decreasing the with making the, the, the sandpaper that I was using finer and finer, until I was reaching uh, a sandpaper that is using to uh, 
uh, Polish windows of jetfighters. So it's very, very fine. It basically mm -hmm. feels like rubber. And uh, when you polish the surface that is basically uh, like uh, very smooth, um, then we would uh, put it in SEM and then it would visualize that we could see it ourselves. But for some reason, I, I couldn't represent. I had an entire lab stacked with all sorts of uh, uh, sandpapers and, and bucking blocks for nails. They also were working at some point. Um, and all different meshes for, for grinding. And uh, yeah, I, I tried everything, uh, whether it was uh, grinding dry or wax, different materials, different speed, different pressure, with drying, with applying with chemicals. It was just, uh, I tried everything that was possible and I could not reproduce in a similar way. And it turns out that just violent approach worked. <laughs> So there you got so, so, uh -huh, so, <laughs> so through this cracking you actually got the smoothness of the surface you needed. Sorry? When, so when you did this cracking, yeah. you got you got the smoothness smoothness of the surface that was needed for the well, scan. It, it's, so we, when we cut, they are still mm -hmm. getting smeared. So basically, what you what you need to do is to bring in a, in a rapid contact uh, the, the blade towards the, the sample. So basically, what happens when the blade is spinning? I would just just tap it gently, so it will just touch the lens and then rip off a little bit of, uh, of, of, of the sample. And uh, that was enough. And it was because there, there was no more kind of uh, uh, other elements that would go right after and, and smear it. So it, it would just remove it and just go away. And that's why it, uh, it kind of rips off the part. And that's why you have patches that are visible, but not everything can be like this way. So, yeah. That's the strength of everybody. Works. That's nice. Yeah, and you found that the, that there was quite some difference uh, compared to what you were, what many thought beforehand with yes. the with the fiber thicknesses. Yes, I mean we compared it to other vertices, and then we think it should happen uh, somewhere in this range, and then uh, it, it turned out that it was much much lower, and we were a bit uh, surprised that that's that's an awesome optical that's an interference or, or fraction happening. It's way too close to 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 wavelength. So uh, they were wondering how did they, uh, how did they do it. I mean, I know that uh, some, I don't remember what it was, they actually showed that the uh, membranes inside of the, that, that they're matching the refractive index of this uh, environment, I mean, the surrounding uh, cells. So that could be also, that could be helpful to have matching of uh, other refractive index that uh, uh, not going to be. The, the thickness of fiber won't be that much of a problem, but still, mm -hmm. it was uh, it was quite a surprise. Uh, they have very very thick fibers. Very mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. I had I I had want to show you one picture I found. Oh, yes. Here you have, yeah, this is the, th the thickness of the fibers. Yeah. Uh, obviously not in Indonesia. But, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. Oh, amazing. <laughs> that would be crazy. Uh, but here, you, and here you have the distance from the outside. That basically means that this is uh, the captain. Okay, all right. Yeah. That's where all the two would have to be. Yes, so that's yes the exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's turning the opposite way around. But, but it's going from the capsule, uh, and then it's going to the capsule. Uh, Later, I think, because it's going to Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This is kind of close to the core. Yeah. Oh. And, and it's, it's a review of, of several studies. Um, so I, I would, I'm trying to understand your data and this data kind of in the combination. I don't know if I've succeeded yet, but maybe you can help me a bit. Because that, that's basically. So the fibers are the fibers in the yeah actually uh, it, yeah it makes sense. <laughs> so okay. the, yeah. So yeah, the fibers in the us, yeah. by, by fibers in the they're much thicker, uh, and that's something that uh, there was also some sort of study in uh, 
uh, what was what's that? Uh, that's the, the fibers in the center, the, in the nucleus, they are actually uh, more round and, and um, rounder, but they are like of, of unknown shape. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they start to getting more and more organized and more uh, and, and flatter. Uh, and that was in, uh, uh, but that was just till certain uh, a certain distance. I think that in this study that uh, they did, it was just a couple of percent of radius from the uh, from the center. Yes, it was a couple a couple of percent of radius. Uh, allow me to find this. Mm -hmm. uh, where? Uh, yeah, yeah. So that was between one and eight percent of a lens radius for, for what they studied was uh, cattle and chicken, and. Uh, mm -hmm. The, our study, when we measured the, the, the fibers of uh, fish, they are a uh, little bit further than that. So we started at uh, 7%, I think. So that's why it could be that uh, they still have this, this similar uh, as mm -hmm. in other animals. But uh, even in the in the study, when they were testing it, they said that, okay, this is, uh, the cells are behaving in, in this way, so they're thick and then getting more organized. And at some point, they would just continue being uh, with the same uh, in the same manner, they will have the same thickness across the entire uh, radius of the lens. Yeah. So that's that, that's what the the picture when I showed with mouse, cow, and, and so on. Uh, so that's basically what they showed that they uh, they measured there at that distance and say, okay, the average is uh, is is this value because they don't seem to change with the radius except for that uh, that uh, nucleus part below uh, let's say eight percent of the radius. Yeah. So if you would point here, because you, you were measuring. You said you were measuring at, uh, I have to look at, at eight, seven, I think seven, eight. That no? was the, the closest that we got. Yeah. So, yeah. What was limiting you there? Why you couldn't go? There was, uh, even though the, as I mentioned, the fish lenses are really hard, so they're hard to dissect. Uh, even though we were approaching with a, with a violent method, they are still hard, mm -hmm. even for, uh, for really fast and uh, industrial uh, saw. Uh, they just simply the, the core is so hard that it just pops and it's just it's gone. So oh, it's okay. Really, yeah, it's okay. it's so hard that it's uh, it doesn't you kind of just crush it. It just just disappears. Mm -hmm. So actually, you couldn't you wouldn't be able to. There was not no chance to eat. No, no, no. Not. Well, that would, for, for now, not with any method. No. So it's no. it's uh, not for us. Mm -hmm. like, like, yeah. <laughs> so it might be as you said, it might be that the fish is actually showing a similar pattern. Uh, larger of larger in the center, yeah. yes, mm -hmm. which is uh, also kind of counterintuitive because they're supposed to have high refractive index, yeah. which means that they're supposed to be smaller if they're using the compaction for for control of refractive index. So, yeah. so, yeah, what we can observe is kind of the reverse. So, they, they actually have, I think it was uh, someone showed a study, and I think it was actually human that. that the fibers on the periphery are so compact that you cannot uh, very often cannot tell the shape. So the, the peripheral ones are more packed, compact rather than the central. And it should be opposite. Mm -hmm. Nature doesn't know what it's doing. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, and it, I was thinking about that because because when you read when you read about human lenses, the compaction theory is the only one that's mentioned. Yes. There's nothing I I didn't find anything on transportation yeah. at all. Uh, but if you look at this data, what what proofs of compaction can you see here, and what what can you see that is not proving compaction? Well, they, uh, I actually don't see that because the compaction should be in the center, so they should actually this this graph would be uh, this graph would prove the compaction if you would demonstrate it the way I, as I did. So this would be center, so they, they would actually have the smaller fibers, then mm. that would be compaction. Uh, I think that the compaction. Theory comes from the uh, from the fact that uh, the fibers are um, that the central fibers are getting uh, are, are getting smaller. As we can see here, uh, and I, as I recall, there was some kind of formation of, of refractive index plateau because of that. So the central ones, uh, central fibers, are being compressed with age. Mm -hmm. That's like mm -hmm. a bit more of an age effect rather than uh, development. And uh, because they are compacting the, the, the refractive index, is just basically uh, flattening out, and that's why they create this kind of plateau. And I guess this is what they uh, assumed with, uh, could be the, uh, the initial idea of why they they believe compaction is behind the uh, control of refractive index. Yeah, this is might be one of those things that were 
thought to be true. Ironically, and that it is, was uh, the paper of the person who said that. So. It was. Yes. <laughs> yeah, just to. Yeah, because as you said, this is, you can see the age thing here, because this the red one here is for the youngest eye, and then uh, so 16 years of age, and, and the blue here is the 25-year-old lens, and then it's 66. And there's for sure some compaction happening yeah. with, with age. But looking at, as you said, we would have expected this curve if it would be that we have the smallest, the thinnest lens fibers in the center, but nothing more. But there's something happening out here, just out the, at the capsule, because they had one data point in here from a uh, from a 44 year old eye, uh, which with a newly formed fibered cell, and that one is actually yes. Yeah, yeah. So this is at the surface. So this is the newest newest shell being added. Yes, and that's what, 44, which is. But this, but they, that they have just one data point. Yeah, unfortunately one. for that one, there was oh. only one. So, okay. But one can also see it a little bit here for the yeah, twenty-five year old. They, they seem to be. Yeah, that's kind of weird. So they drop, they they form as thick fibers, and then then they are starting to decompress. That's that's kind of a, um, <coughs> a kind of interesting. So they they would age the peripheral ones with. <coughs> but this is wait, hold on, because this is not normal. Life. You also think about that. So this it's is not, surface. No. Ah, but mm -hmm. you can kind of go around because that's the center. That's always the surface. So um, mm -hmm. there's only there with age you have. But does this mean that I have trouble to understand this because of the age and the, the reverse mm -hmm. uh, uh, axis? Does this mean that they produce the? Uh, no, we don't know if this is new, newly formed. Does this mean that they, when you produce the fibers, also they are? Um, like with no, we would age them for this one. Change the lens. All right. Well, I yeah, I uh, I don't know really what uh, what I what I'm supposed to be. Seeing. No, I don't, I don't. I don't. It's very interesting that it's it's completely different than what uh, what you see in pictures. In, in, yeah, you saw the profiles that were just yeah completely flat, and this one is uh, yeah just as it's supposed to be, but reversed. So uh, mm -hmm. yeah, that's that's right. quite funny. Uh, so, but yeah, you could kind of see the maybe like, overall compression if you compare the 16 year old and the curve for 66 year old, yeah. they are generally yeah. lower. Yes, so that, yes. that, that that's a, a compression with age yeah, seems yeah, to yeah, be yeah. there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's mm -hmm. it's an overall uh, compression. Mm -hmm. It's not only the center, but it seems to be also the peripheral ones also yes. compressed. Yes. Uh, yes, but there's no there. Mm -hmm. I can't see any proof in here as a compression with. Um, yeah. Uh, with with the growth as such. Yeah, yeah, it makes yeah, right, almost yeah. yeah. That's why we stepped in with fish. Yes, <laughs> that's, and there's definitely a lot of more things to learn about how how this works. Um, can I put it away somehow? Uh, you can press there. There's a, a small oh, yeah. 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 Um. So. Why does the eye actually, why does the lens grow? You know why it grows? To, well, because the animal grows too, so it would be, uh, well, you need to keep up the, with the animal. So yeah, but, to... but the lens continues growing even when the animal stops. Which, do you mean fish? Or, well, I know too little about fish, but the human, yeah. Okay, well, yeah. fish, at least, mm -hmm. then they, they typically keep up growing, and uh, so the body grows, the eye grows, so does the lens, because they, uh, they want to see, uh, yeah, they want to see sharp image. I mean, if you would have a larger eye and you would have a smaller lens. Uh, you also want to kind of uh, use the advantage of, of having the optics because that's also that brings up more light. Uh, okay. so you have, uh, yeah, more things to work with when you have to see a larger eye space. So they grow so that so the lens is quite the human lens is more like this. It's another reason to mm -hmm. Uh, we don't want to have tiny, tiny lenses. So we can't have big. That's also the, the limit is the other way around. You want to exploit the, the size of lens rather than reduce it. Yeah. I have tons of questions left, but I guess I keep that for tonight or something. Like that, <laughs> and I should let the, <laughs> I should let the committee step in. All right.
Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Thomas. So this uh, brings us to the committee. I have a chance to ask questions. And you have to decide among you who starts. <laughs> I start at this end. Sure. Okay. Um, first of all, I think it's, it's important that everybody understands how difficult it is to present scientific data in a way that normal humans can understand. <laughs> I'm assuming you're normal humans. Um, and I've seen it done so badly, so many times. So I'd like to say today that actually... Thomas showed it how it really should be done. I thought your presentation was tremendous. And I think you gave us a masterclass on how you should present scientific data. It was clear, it was concise, it was wonderful. So I don't know what you're intending to do with the rest of your life, but <laughs> seriously consider staying in academia. Don't go away and make money in industry. Um, it would be a shame to lose you. <laughs> Having said that, this is the last nice thing I'm going to say. <laughs> because you are defending your thesis. All right. Your job is to defend. My job is to attack. Okay? That's right. how I see this. Okay. Um, so, the lens, as far as I'm concerned, is just a dump of lump of dead cells that doesn't do anything and can't ever change. Um, and you're going to have to do something to convince me that it can. So in your first paper, um, and I, I know this is a repeat of a question, but Linda is nice and I'm not. Um, <laughs> I want to know how you change refractive index in a matter of hours between night and day. Um, or the distribution, the profile. You said somehow change refractive index. It needs to be done precisely. It does. Do it precisely. How can how can you change a refractive index in a couple of hours? I just don't get it. That's a very good question. <laughs> uh, it is. That's why I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, the paper number two and three show that at least uh, direction we can look at. So uh, it's uh, very likely that it's actually the proteins that are. But they're quite. Those are quite long-term changes in two and three, aren't they? Uh, yes. In, yes. But if we know that there is some mechanism or some path to, to do it, then we can. Well, we can assume, but uh, there is a chance that also the, the, the those paths or those mechanisms are uh, used for the short uh, for short term changes. It would be nice to know if, for instance, cell size changed oh, during, yeah. light and, during light and dark. That would be great, yes. But uh, we, didn't, uh, we didn't do that. Yeah, as you said, you need to do it precisely. Yeah, but that would be actually uh, interesting. Although I don't know if it's uh, if the method is, is precise enough, because the, the changes in refractive index, they must be really subtle. And the difference in thickness that can uh, be a consequence of these changes uh, may not be that uh, that large for us to pick up. As you saw the data when I was showing the box, but the, the variation is quite large, so it could actually get lost in there. So I, I'm not sure it would be interesting to see, but I don't think that we actually would be able to see something using, using just the uh, cell thickness. Just can I ask something? I, 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 it's probably just not known. But um, if you kept these Atlantic cod in, in darkness, um, would these changes still happen? That, that is, is there an endogenous component to them? I mean, you expose them to light and yes. dark. Yeah. Um, but would these changes still continue on a 24 hour period? Uh, even no, if they were they, not. They're typically triggered by, uh, by, by big light. And by, they are uh, triggered by light. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So they would they would just keep uh, keep the lenses. In. So it means that during the polar night they do have those uh, those lenses that are not very well uh, adapted for for the, for the purpose of proper the visual conditions. Okay. Now your second paper, the osmolarity paper. Yeah. Um, you tried two osmolarities. 
Not many. Yes. <laughs> why, why did you not try and find the optimum osmolarity? We did. I um, mean, we, we tried that. That's was the that's how we found the 240. Uh, so we you tried ones in between as well. We, uh, we actually, uh, which we mentioned in the paper, we tried 180 as well. So that's uh, the, the 320 and 240. That's around 75 percent. Uh, 240 is 75 percent of 320. So we were uh, deciding to we decided to change um, that the, the osmolality difference will be uh, in relative means rather than just values. So the next one was also 75 percent of 240, which is 180. So we actually tested that, but the osmolality was so mismatched that um, the lenses were were degenerating so quickly that the moment we start observing them, they were already very low. So when we normalized them, they were actually uh, amazing because they showed that the, the quality is really high and it maintains and it's just perfect. Except that the images we saw was we, we, we they were far from perfect. Really far from perfect. So. Uh, it was just the changes were happening so fast that we, we couldn't even uh, put them for measurements. So we tried actually three ones. And, uh, but we, way before that, we actually uh, scanned through, uh, I think we started as low as 50 and we went as far as 400 or something, 500. Because the idea was that if we will have this kind of slopes, um, we would be, so for every mismatch, you would have the slope. Uh, so they are going down more. And when the more match it is, the more flat this, this line is. So we would expect that there will be a mismatch and that this curve would be just getting flatter and flatter, and then it could start dropping. So we were hoping that we could put some kind of threshold or something, and then we would see the, the uh, some kind of peak and we would find which is the optimal. Yeah, well, that, that's kind of what I was hoping. Yeah, but uh, uh, working with larvae and, and measuring this, it's uh, it's not an easy, uh, easy task. It's uh, very tedious and not very successful, like the, just just the fact that you take a larvae doesn't mean that you will have data. Because you need to dissect 120 microns uh, lens from a, from a tiny, tiny animal uh, using these giant hands. Well, we were using smaller hands, so, so my colleague there, but uh, it's still a difficult uh, job. And sometimes you just uh, simply damage the lens. And also the changes are so uh, so rapid, especially that already the old, uh, beyond 180 was, uh, 180 was already too low. So that's why we, we kind of get a feeling what is the proper osmolality, and that's what we um, what we tested. Uh, and it seems to be uh, working very, very well. Uh, what we, well, I would argue that it's very close, at least, to the optimal one is the, actually the fixation. If you have the, the core in it's, uh, uh, it's arced and very smooth. And that's why I would say that this is, this is where the value is, that uh, we are very, very close, if not uh, right on point. Uh, but to be, I mean, to be fair, with the histology, you've shown us one picture. Um, yeah, I've got that question. How representative are those? Yeah, images? I mean, you know, where's the quantification of yeah. non-smoothness of the cornea? Yeah, so because there was, uh, it's 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 kind of crazy to make a quantification of smoothness. Uh, so we, we decided to look at the other parameter, which is the thickness of the retina. And that's why we, uh, we measured that, because it would be, uh, it's possible, but it's not always quite convincing to develop some kind of model that quantifies how, how smooth the, the curvature is, especially that we don't, uh, we cannot assume any shape because, uh, uh, yeah, it, it can be basically, uh, that's why we didn't try to go with this because we would put a lot of work, we would get some quantification and it wouldn't be convincing enough anymore. So we decided to measure just the, uh, just the thickness. Uh, and yeah, the answer to that would be question how representative the images are, the, the answer is that they are very I mean, if you would, if I, now after this, this presentation, when I said that the, the, cur, the, the cornea should be smooth and uh, that the 320 produces a little bit folded one and uh, pronostic fixative produces very folded one, I could just show all 18 images and you all could clearly identify and se se separate it to three different groups without any problem or, or training or, or uh, knowledge. Just, just, just looking by the, the cornea, Clear to say this is 240, this is Fernosky, this is 320. So they're really uh, clear that you can. I was actually doing a, a blindfolded test on myself. I, I, I printed all the images right in from the from the back and then just shuffled them and then I tried to categorize them. 100% uh, success. So they are really, really representative. Yeah. Well, it's good to know. Yeah. Um, and th then just finally, um, 
I commend your optimism in thinking that papers three and four are two different papers. Um, <laughs> to me, to me, they're the same paper. Why would you be able to publish that in two papers? Uh, because they tell a little bit different story. But I, I, I would see that. Why, why would you say that? Because the first one is it's actually just uh, first one is more concentration on hey people we found a way because that's actually important because there was no method to to dissect. So I think that just the fact that we found uh, a tool for for investigation efficiency is is, uh, is worth publishing. So. Uh, just to make it not make it empty with lots of data in it, uh, but it could. I could argue that this could be moved to the paper three, and we could just publish the method paper. Unfortunately, people don't want to have just that method paper, so that's why we uh, we decided to use the the chance and, and measure. Plus, it's uh, as I said, it's a little bit different story. Here we are, we are investigating more uh, more closely with a much larger sample. Uh, we we're looking at different differences between small and large lenses, whereas the other one is looking at the, the profiles. So. Uh, when I drew, when we were describing the conclusions of the uh, of paper number four, uh, one of the, the, the kind of questions that we were uh, we had to answer was there. Um, okay, so if the model is is, is is predicting that the proteins are being transported and not compacted, uh, why can we why can we reject this this hypothesis? It's because we don't see the profile, the differences between radial uh, positions. But we also need to include, because someone said that, okay, maybe radial positions are not visible, but it will be visible uh, in the difference between small lenses and large lenses. And this is where uh, paper three shows that it actually been tested and there is no difference between uh, lens sizes. So that's why I think it's uh, it's then for two lenses. So we, <laughs> we will see. I, I hope I'm right. <laughs> I, I will stop torturing you. I can, right. I, I can carry on for days, but you shan't. Okay, then I will continue. So a lot of the questions I had have already been uh, answered, which is great. But let's continue from the point where you stopped. Okay. All right. So, <laughs> so first I have a, a channel question. You say that uh, in fish you have this very high index of refraction of 1.55 in the center. Yeah. The nucleus going up to 1.38. Do you know to which protein doesn't it correspond? Uh, well, uh, as I mentioned, it's uh, there's only just one paper I think that was looking at the distribution of different uh, uh, of different crystallines. Uh, yeah, that would have been one question to see do, uh, what you know about the relative uh, proportions of the different crystallines. Not so easy, uh -huh. but but the total concentration. Yeah. Is, is there any idea about the total concentration in the center? In the center. In, in the nucleus. Well, we can we can just uh, we can just speculate based on, based on the refractive index. And mm -hmm. uh, when I was actually doing the modeling, uh, when I had to actually uh, use the high refractive index increment because mm -hmm. when I was modeling with uh, a little bit lower, I said like, okay, let's not go with the highest, let's go with something in the middle. It ended up with like uh, 105 percent concentration in the center, which doesn't make sense. So it's really hard to reach the same refractive index with uh, with with just proteins of, of uh, lower increment. So when you say 105 percent, what do you mean mass? That way, when I was calculating the uh, the, the necessary amount of, uh, of, of proteins, so that it was. If you ask about like how uh, how much generally like the balance between water and protein, it, in center it's almost as the refractive index is almost as high as, as the dry pure protein. Yeah, you know? so it could be that. I mean, it's uh, you can see it when you when you try to dissect that. Uh, I think I even broke a scalpel on the, on the core. So it's really really hard. Yeah. Uh, I don't I don't. Yeah, the concentration is. So it's a solid, basically, or a gas, or an arrested state, clearly, because you have the volume fractions probably up to 90% or something. So do you have any? No, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> Is it that visible? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I would just have been curious. Of course, this is not directly part of your thesis, but do you know whether there is any ideas of how such a protein, I well, it even cannot say protein solution, it's rather a protein melt or yeah, something. Yeah. Can one compare this to a 
polymer melt or how would you think of that? Because it's, it can't be, if, if you have a volume fraction of, I don't know, 80-90%, you cannot have some globular proteins there anymore because you would always have uh, much more room. You cannot pack them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I really have no idea. I mean, the core is, as I mentioned, it's almost like black hole. That we cannot see beyond yeah. the event of horizon. It's just unknown. It's like, it's and nobody has ever taken this core and tried to dilute it and make some... They, the the, the, the methods that were using the dilution and uh, comparing it, uh, checking the different uh, concentrations or, or proportions between the different mm -hmm. uh, they only go up to like 50, 60 percent of rate strong surface, and then they just describe, oh, this is uh, um, uh, this we can we can dissolve it. Yeah. So those are uh, undissolvable proteins of unknown kind, basically. Uh, I don't know. It's a weird thing because they give up so early. <laughs> mm. But this takes me to the next question because I want you to. <clears throat> so you say a couple of times. So I think this is the bottom line of. of of your baby. So there is an unknown mechanism of transporting crystalline synthesized in the periphery to yeah. the denucleated fibers in the center of the lens during growth. So the, this is the main outcome. Yeah. And you are very careful and you do not speculate in, in your manuscripts, but I want you to speculate. No. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I mean, uh, yeah, uh, there are actually some of when I make uh, that picture. Uh, Showing. Sorry. Ah, okay. Not going. Uh, so there is a, a, a one one place where, where I would be uh, looking at, which is the connection between fibers. If you look at this figure, uh, you can see that between on the surface of the on the surface of the of the fibers, you see, you see those protrusions. protrusions. And uh, I'm not necessarily saying that this, this is the the way to go because there's uh, uh, there's there are gap junctions that are used for uh, nurturing the the, the, uh, the the fibers inside. But there was a paper which uh, which kind of identified some kind of channels that would be uh, uh, that would allow transportation of uh, Proteins and larger molecules that goes towards the lens. They were they were using some kind of uh, uh, fluorescent staining pro fluorescent stained proteins, and they were just uh, injecting the lens, and they were looking how it's spreading. And it seems that there was there was some pathway uh, inwards to the lens that uh, that allowed transportation of higher uh, of higher uh, of larger molecules and proteins. Via a carrier. Or, uh, Sorry? Is, is there a carrier protein? I don't, I don't think they study specifically the, the okay. transportation, but uh, uh, they, they, yeah, just uh, they were looking at whether there was a path up to, to allow this, this to happen, and they uh, they found some kind of possible way. So that would be the, the guess. But if they could, the lenses would transport proteins using those channels, and this could be something similar here if you have uh, this. this Protrusions sticking out between the between two different fibers, mm -hmm. and they could just transport this way. But aren't these fibers um, at the same radius? So it so those transport. two. So for example, those two are on the same radius, but this yeah. is like inner. So you shell. do also. So this is like kind of peeled it. off. Uh, yes. uh, yeah, this is a peeled off uh, a fiber. So those probably you could find that one of those those. The bumps is probably matching okay. somewhere one of those those yeah. yeah. But then I, I can buy this maybe in the periphery where you still have some uh, fluid uh, yeah. protein solution. But we were just talking about this extremely uh, solid uh, yes. issues. Yeah, but uh, note that we are actually not touching the 
that the closer to center you get the least adjustment you have to do because they yes, are absolutely. Like but is this is the border really there where the uh, so is fluid? Sorry. <clears throat> But still, you will have to also uh, increase the concentration in the part which is solid, probably. Or... Well, this part, well, okay, okay, this is not really visible here because uh, I just made it simple. But this part is is uh, very flat, actually. So I, yeah. you, you don't expect uh, to change there a lot. So uh, it's mostly where uh, this part when, when all the changes are happening. So this part is a little bit flatter in the practical index. Not visible. I'm very sure it's not. It's not visible here. Yeah, uh, so that's why uh, yeah. maybe the, the confusing part. Because if it would be uh, steep uh, going down like this, then yes, they would need to increase also in the center. But it's a little bit more flat in the center. So that's why uh, they, they typically need to be yeah. So we think that solid part there is. I think it just in, stays yeah. there to, to some point. That they don't. Mm -hmm. uh, um, they don't need to increase their effective index mm -hmm. in the center, they just need to maintain the shape of, the, of that profile. So basically, whenever you increase them, everything else must increase. And you know, the, the ones that are, uh, if you remember the animation that was on the periphery, it started very fast, it jumped mm -hmm. quickly, and then it was just slowing down. Mm -hmm. So basically, the closer to the center, the, the less changes you can expect. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's why I guess it will still work. Mm -hmm. A final question concerning the gamma crystal is because right. you. You mentioned that so when when it was about cataract and that is uh, less abundant in fish. Yeah. Uh, you speculate that maybe it's due to the high proportion of, of gamma crystalline, which you have heard of that it is not so prone to aggregation. How do are you so how uh, this uh, the, the the literature that you read about this? How did they come to this conclusion? Because. We're also working with, with gamma crystal, and yes. I have exactly the other uh, experience with gamma crystal. I guess the, the papers I was reading were outdated, and maybe that's the foundation that is shaking. <laughs> okay, uh, and then, I, I, I was looking for specifically because I, I have heard this and I read it somewhere, and there was no reference. So I was specifically mm -hmm. looking for this, and then, uh, yeah, that paper that was uh, was just mentioning that, it, uh, uh, that they aggregate less and uh, than, than others. Couldn't it be also due to the fact that because usually most of the times, so there is there is um, cataract uh, in humans or in, in mammalians, mm -hmm. starting from the center. But I think when you have a frozen center, a frozen nucleus, mm -hmm. and arrested state, not much can go on. So do you have any experience or data about if there is cataract in fish? Is it does it start from the periphery or from the nucleus? As I mentioned, that the only thing we knew about the, the cataract is that it's a apparently a problem in uh, in salmon farm salmon mm -hmm. farming, but uh, we didn't have a chance to to look more in details so where it is born or what's the cause for it. So I, I can't really uh, that that would be interesting because I think well, it might be due to the fact that it's simply an arrested state and then nothing is aggregating or phase separating or doing anything else which would give rise to light scattering. Yeah. So maybe this is in favor of the fish. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think yeah, I also stop torturing you now. Thank you. <laughs> it's my time to torture you. Yes. <laughs> so as Stone said, I'm, I'm interested in, in what uh, fish use their eyes for. What's the function of their eyes in their ecology? So I have a couple of questions then. So in the Atlantic cord, you uh, contrast the Atlantic to the polar cord, and there were differences in their way that they adapted to light. Uh, so there's some plasticity in their light adaptation there. So uh, what's the biological uh, implications of that? What's the function? What's the benefit of this plasticity? All right, so I think this is where I, I should put up the um, figures here again. Um, it will be easier to discuss them. Um, I think we should start with the, the negative. Uh, so, so basically when you have, well, well actually, let's start from the beginning. So basically when you have multifocality, we assume that this is to, uh, to have polar vision. Uh, because uh, generally plasticity and this kind of uh, level of precision with controlling refractive index it requires uh, some energy. And uh, if you don't really need it, then it probably will drop it. So if they have the multifocality, they 
uh, probably would uh, would benefit from this for color vision. And uh, this is what you see when they are uh, light adapted. So they are uh, they are multiple colors, which means that they are uh, probably using the, the color vision there. Uh, what happens at night is that it's um, the lens is kind of still multifocal, but we don't. We, we argue that it's uh, it's probably not very functional because of uh, uh, how the overall it, it shift further, so it's focused further, and uh, uh, and also that we have a region that uh, focuses light that probably the, that probably fish uh, uh, doesn't see. So we argue that they actually during night that they're uh, not using uh, vision in their natural habitat. So it's also of course interesting how it affects them uh, when they live up north. When, there's a half a year of dark that they somehow need to uh, navigate. So I assume they wouldn't, they wouldn't be able to use their vision. So they need to uh, survive using other sensors, I guess. Um, so yeah, that's 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 how it works. And with when it comes to uh, uh, Atlantic cod, uh, sorry, polar cod, uh, they they seem to have uh, also multiple lenses, which is interesting. But this is where we are lacking the information about the retina because. Uh, we do not know what is there. Right? It could be a similar case with, uh, case with Atlantic cod. So they, they do not use vision during uh, during night time. They just use other senses. And then during the uh, uh, during the seasonal changes, uh, put back this one. Uh, that they're actually getting a little bit uh, more. Well, I would say flat and proper, but it's still a little bit, it's still multifocal. It's actually more multifocal than this one because you can see certain plateaus that could be uh, could be the, the, the distances at which you concentrate. So if you imagine that you would have this uh, this graph shifted as I showed you with the chromatic aberration, then you could pro probably find some kind of uh, distance at which you have all the lines uh, uh, in points. So yeah, uh, it's possible that uh, they don't see, but uh, it's hard to tell without looking at the retina because there, there are some animals that. Have nine Who knows? Maybe, maybe polar bears would be So, but there, I mean, <clears throat> what you said that you caught the fish at uh, uh, at depths about 170 up to 300 meters. Yeah. So, what's the use of color vision at, at, at those depths? Not much. No. So, there is so why do they? Uh, at this well, they, there's still uh, bioluminescence, and uh, you still want to. Well, I mean, the, the argument here is that they they actually uh, do at night, but they don't uh, really see. Uh, during the, the the day, they could probably use the, the vision in a uh, uh, little bit more shallow depths, for example. Uh, so there's still a benefit of having. Plus, to pick up the the bioluminescence, it's also quite uh, favorable to to have sharp vision mm -hmm. during the daytime. Okay. Now uh, you mentioned some some blood costs, so we don't go into that, but. Uh... Uh, in the osmolality paper, you said uh, early <clears throat> in the introduction that your aim with that study was to investigate if small animals <clears throat> can form well-focused images early in development. And then you sort of got lost in osmolality. Yeah. So what's your answer to the aim of your study? Uh, well, the aim of the study, uh, what we wanted to originally look is to whether the, uh, what's the focal, because if you want to have a sharp image, uh, in the plane, you need to have a, a, a lens that forms the image in retina that picks it up. So we wanted to test just that, what's the focal length of the of the lens and uh, how far are, is the retina. In case of uh, larvae, the retina is right there next to the, the lens, so we were looking actually at the outer segments of the receptors. Uh, but we wanted to, to test that, what's the distance between uh, lens and the upper segments, and what is the focal length? The problem was that we uh, every single feature we found was the with collapsed uh, cornea and very small retina. So we, we actually thought originally that uh, because of this osmolality that the lens is pushed in, and we actually were uh, we thought that uh, maybe that's why there's no no space between the lens and the, the retina. Later it showed that actually there's still no space; that it's just how it's formed. Uh, but uh, but the retina gets smaller anyway. So uh, yeah, that, using our method, I think that would be the, the follow-up uh, study. Someone should actually do what we tried to do at the beginning. So measure the, the, the focal length of the uh, of the of the fish larvae lenses and measure the distance to uh, to the upper segments. As well, I mean, of course, we uh, 
we had a chance to check check that, and it seems to be matched. We just didn't uh, we just didn't concentrate it to publish uh, this story and uh, and make it about the small arc. But we we did look, and it seems that they so uh, so back to the question again. Then. Yeah. Do you do you think that they can form well focused? Yes. Uh, at least there uh, at least there is optics there is optics that can uh, focus on uh, the outer segment of the receptors and they do show behavioral uh, visually guided behavior and they, they were actually hunting at uh, mm -hmm. uh, five days post fertilization and that's actually quite important because they have uh, they still have a bit of the sacs, so they will uh, have a bit of overlap when they start uh, feeding themselves and when they still have some mm -hmm. uh, some backup and it's I think it's like two days tops overlap and uh, that is of course in individuals so they do have to start to hunt and uh, there was some study also showing that they uh, they're following their prey uh, with eye movement so they they use vision for sure mm -hmm. yeah and it's uh, we can we never can say that like yeah we know there's C sharp vision we can say they're using vision and the optics is there to show to make sharp images so I guess they see sharp but we cannot see definitely we would have to ask them. Thank you. Right, then I'd like to thank the examination committee. And um, that brings us to the last point of today. Uh, questions from the audience. In case Thomas has any questions left, you're free to try to find them. <laughs> yes? Uh, just a comment about the thicker uh, cell layers in the center of the human lens. Maybe it's because the reflective gradient is pretty flat there. And therefore, the steps of homogeneous refractive index within one layer, it doesn't need to be so fine. In the periphery, where the, the slope of the gradient is very sharp, you should have small steps. That be? Maybe it is. I don't know. <laughs> Do the inner cells of the of the lens have any ribosomes or anything like that? Could they? Uh, they get rid of everything because they don't want to have uh, any scapula. Yes. Well, the ribosomes are like super tiny. And even <laughs> I don't even know how big they are. They're, they're a couple of how big are they? They have just a few um, few uh, nucleotides, and that's it. Then if they are not scattered, then maybe they are there. I uh, I don't think people people really look into that. They did. When they look at the uh, breakdown of organelles that they're concentrating, of course, on, on the EPA and mitochondria, but uh, I assume that they break down. Uh, they're much, much, much smaller than, than those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then uh, I guess people are not looking into that specifically because I guess it's not really relevant for for, uh, for the optics if it's, if it's so tiny. Because yes, I was thinking maybe they could, uh, instead of sending in uh, proteins from the periphery, you can send in basically mRNA or something and then have the if you have the amino acids and so on build the proteins in there without the nucleus. Without the build the proteins. I mean you need to have some kind of information still. Yeah you need to have the mRNA sent in. Yeah. You need to have the ribosomes there and you yeah. need to have the amino acids to build it. And sure. uh, so you can send those in a sense you have a small thing that you send in build it inside. Sure. I will tell you just uh, just what I know about the, the breakdown of organelles, uh, they just look into this. So I guess uh, it's a possible uh, explanation how they could increase the uh The transport is just, just the one hypothesis that still needs to be tested, but sure, maybe there's uh, another thing to do so. You want to comment on that, Anna? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any other questions? Maybe I can make do a comment. The ribosomes are gone. There are no, no ribosomes. They are gone. Okay. Right. It seems we don't have an awful lot of questions left. Oh, we've used almost two and a half hours. So I think we should end this session. And uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you. Right. Thank you.
Ja, das ist ja, 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 ja,